And we now are live. We were listening to a little uh, Daguerre. Can you, can you do a little tushy shake like you were dancing before? The no. diamond's on the sole <laughs> of your shoes now. No, he's not high enough. But uh, anyway, good morning, everyone. Welcome. We got a great guest today, and I'm going to pass it off to Brian to get things started. Absolutely. Um, good morning, Living Soil Nerds. You know, each and every Thursday, Leighton, myself, uh, Peter and Daguerre, we're going out of our way to bring you the best and brightest. And um, before I ever showed my face on Instagram, um, before uh, a lot of stuff was even being done on social media, uh, Mariah LaChapelle was out there educating the community and educating the community on how they combat um, Mother Nature with Mother Nature. And so that's one of the things that really stuck out to me. Um, she's an OG, if you will, for a lot of us that were trying to understand more about uh, moving away from the bro science that was being pumped out, especially um, just even a few years ago. There's still a lot of, uh, in my eyes, bullshit that was being um, uh, spoken on that was supposedly going to help you with IPM protocols. Um, so, Mariah, I know that you go out of your way to, to educate, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted you to have wanted you to have the opportunity to be on the show and, and really give you a voice today uh, so that you can kind of uh, go out of your way to dispel a lot of the bro science so that we can unlearn a lot of things that I feel like uh, we thought were gospel for, for a, lot of, a lot of years. Yeah, I think that, I mean, the simplest way to put it is my career developed around cannabis to some extent, the legalization at least. I came from ornamental horticulture I used to work at Monrovia, you know, where you Lowe's, Home Depot, you see those green banded pots. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, the nursery I worked at 600 acres of container ornamental production. And my job was to scout and release beneficial insects and then come up with the least toxic options. So when I moved from that into a sales position, I thought I, idealistically that I was mostly going to work in ornamental horticulture and advise on least toxics. But really what happened instead was recreational cannabis became legalized and people couldn't have the residual pesticides that they had before. So with that came a, a lot of growth in the beneficial insect market and people were just grasping for as much information as they could. And like you mentioned, some of it is not well vetted. So when I work with um, any active ingredient, I'm looking at efficacy and then regulation and then trying to come up with how beneficial insects fit into the program too. And I kind of developed all my relationships around that. Now I am in a national position and I advise, and I, my emphasis isn't necessarily cannabis, it's everybody that needs alternatives. Yes, you just really stuck out because you are obviously an educated Did individual, we just lose, uh, uh, but you weren't, um, you weren't talking over everybody's head. And that was something that I really appreciated uh, at your talk when you were, you know, we're just farmers for a lot of us right. over here. And so when, uh, yes, we want to know the Latin words, we'd love to be able to pronounce them, but it seems like for whatever reason, you guys continue to change that. Like Hypiosis Miles finally figured out how to pronounce that back in the day. And now it's something skidamus or something like that, right? So um, there's, a, there's a lot of us that are just trying to even keep up with that. So we want to talk about a variety of beneficial bugs. We want to talk about pro, uh, predatory mites. Sure. Um, but we, again, we want to dispel some of the uh, bullshit that's out there. So uh, one of the first things I wanted to start off with is uh, at least the hottest topic right now. Uh, Leighton and I have talked about it a few times on the show is ladybugs and how every single ladybug that is sold is wild crafted. So uh, we'd love to hear from you as the expert on what's really going down uh, when you are purchasing ladybugs. Sure. That's a great first question. Honestly, I think that, and there is somewhere on my Instagram, I can repost it. There is a beautiful graphic that I think BioB originally shared that has written out why purchasing late. There's just so many drawbacks to it that people aren't aware of. First of all, as you mentioned there, they are caught always in the wild. Somebody literally goes up to the Sierra mountains or Southern Oregon and scoops them up. And then they arrive starving. And in many cases, they're not the native species. So you're introducing an invasive into the environment and then they come hungry. So their drive actually is to reproduce, not eat. So when you see that ladybug orgy, it's not them like actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. It's they're reproducing, spending their resources, dying. You get a little bit of, of reproduction and consumption, but then you look down, especially in an indoor room and just, you know, a graveyard of dead lady ladybugs that you could have spent uh, the same amount of money on lacewing and aphidias or even less and have better efficacy. 
And a lot yeah. of this is around the cannabis aphid, honestly. Yeah, and I want to get more involved with you is, on that. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, again, for a lot of us that were first starting out, it seemed like ladies, ladybugs were the, the holy grail at the time, the thing that yeah. the canary in the coal mine that could potentially say. And we had no idea that we were also potentially purchasing these ladybugs and then ourselves with our own money, uh, potentially adding pathogens ourselves into our grow room. So could you talk about that a little bit? Well, I think when it comes to introduction of pathogens in general, sanitation is the biggest problem. So, and in California, of course, you've got aspergillus that people say are caused from beneficial insects, but it's ubiquitous. That means it's everywhere aspergillus is. So it could come in on your beneficial insects, but it could also come in on you. So uh, that's where starting with clean rooms by using the right sanitizers is the better way to go. Is it worth it if you, if you do know maybe you have a better source or something like that? Because a lot of us you know, again, back in the day, we're, we're trying to figure out how to get them to breed, to create the ladybug larvae that looks more of like a little alligator. Yeah. Um, Are we talking about an indoor production though, or outdoor? Indoor production. Yeah. That's one of the bigger issues. Cause it seems like in an outdoor production, that wasn't an issue. And it, is there something to sunlight and that's the only way that they will reproduce and we can't obviously recreate, recreate that indoors. No, well, I think that if you're going to put the resources into what they call banker plants, which is growing beneficial insects in an indoor environment, you want to put in the least amount of effort for your for your money in both time and, you know. And so what I recommend, and it comes from ornamental horticulture, is uh, alyssum, which is a, a just a white flowering plant. And you can release aureus, which is the minute pirate bug. And it's a generalist predator, so it does a lot of work for you. Like goes after life stages of thrips, goes after mites. So as opposed to trying to breed ladybugs, I would recommend alyssum and uh, aureus. You know, I got I got one to throw at you. Um, I'm sure you're aware of Suzanne Bug Lady. Yeah, we were on a panel just earlier this week, actually. She's 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 a godsend. I love her. She's no no nonsense. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. And we have that in common. Yeah, beautiful. So. Yeah. I, I, conversation with her a uh, number of years back about is it possible to get the same uh, kind of balance that we can get in a living soil with you know all of the soil uh, organisms worms springtails you know uh, isopods is there a way to do that with banker plants in an indoor environment so that you're getting a more diverse uh, group of bugs to work for you yeah, I mean, so if you're really seeing, and, and I think about it, my my great example is uh, le lettuce in the Salinas Valley. So, for example, Earthbound Farms we work with out there, and they plant strips of alyssum among their, their lettuce. And you get uh, native green lacewing, you get, like I mentioned, aureus, predatory mites, surfid flies, you get a whole combination of insects that come into the system that will eat pollen and use that nectar from the crop as their environment. So in a living soil setting, it's hard to say how well it applies, but uh, it, it's an option. So there's your gold bar out of the gate, Brian. Uh, <laughs> I know you haven't heard her uh, speak yet, Leighton, but she was, uh, when she gave her presentation, she was rapid firing and um, it, it was just, it was a uh, eye-opening to to learn that you can use Mother Nature to combat Mother Nature. I mean, that no one was talking about that back then. Um, so her her talk was definitely um, a pioneer at, at that time for sure. Everybody was just talking about what to spray or if there were certain issues. Everybody was just spraying neem. You know, it was very basic things back then. Well, um, and I would say I don't think that trade shows have evolved yet for the cannabis industry around education well enough. Yeah, I mean, we behind the scenes. You know, there's ways that definitely that we could prove a lot of stuff. What I liked is you were just out there with your torch, you know, on stage, just telling it like it is. And that's yeah. you know, Leighton is obviously known for that as well. You know, I feel like all of us on the show, that's our personality is we just want real information. Don't sugarcoat shit with us. Uh, just come at us with what, what's correct. And that's something that I feel like, Mariah, you're at least in my, my eyes, you are definitely known for. Um, so we want to kind of continue to break down a lot of these things like, OK, so if we're not using uh, ladybugs, you know, now we kind of started learning more about green lace wings and now we're starting to learn more about brown lace wings. So uh, for the newer viewers, could you kind of break down what a green lace wing is? And then I'm sure some of the advanced farmers might not even know that there is a brown lace wing. 
Well, the thing about brown lacewing is that you need an import permit for it. So it's actually just, just do green lacewing. Okay. Uh, it does the same job, basically. I think sometimes we get these online resources where somebody lists brown lacewing and everybody goes for it. But Chrysoperla species is the easiest way to go. Um, and there's multiple suppliers of green lacewing. I like the eggs on cards for the most part because then you can hang them. It's more direct release. But then you can also, uh, you know, shake them the eggs on, and that's a much cheaper way to go. And then Aphidias colmani, which is a parasitic wasp, you know, they fly. So then you really benefit from their dispersal. And how long does that cycle usually complex, take? What's that? If you had an infestation, how long would it take to kind of go through that cycle where you started to see results? So the lacewing, the lacewing will hatch in like two to three days, but to get control is a different thing. And this gives, gives into the bigger discussion of IPM, because if you have a high uh, insect pest prop population and, and the beneficial insects have to meet or exceed the control. So. Yeah, that was especially in the larger and larger facilities or the, the room that just seems like it never ends. That was one of the biggest issues that we found was uh, there'd always somehow be these little pockets that you really couldn't get. And then that would continue to be just a catch 22 kind of thing. Uh, are there other ways that you feel like you found that um, these beneficial insects are I know everything's not totally in a symbiotic relationship yeah. there, but for the most part, um, what do you see that will work or at least play nicely with each other? Actually, all I would say all, all beneficial insects do in different ways, right? I think when it comes down to it, the first thing you need to do is identify the pest correctly and then work your way up outwards. And an another thing I was going to mention is that I feel distinct in the regard that I'm not against advising on sprays because the ultimate goal is, is control where you put in enough money, put in enough in terms of your input to make money on the crop, right? So there are cases, cannabis aphid is a prime example. If you're completely infested, you know, th there needs to be sprays enough to get to the point, like I mentioned, where you get the control. So, and as to how, how beneficial insects and how well they play nice, I mean, there's examples, California eats persimilis eggs. So if you re re release the two together, you might not get control. But I focus more on, how well it worked than these inner guild predation is what they call it, whether or not they're eating each other. That And that's, again, some of us, I feel like we spent so much money because we didn't understand those little right. things that you had just mentioned. Or, you know, a lot of us thought the Swarovski might, you know, it, it did seem to be effective, but then at the same time, you would have to continue to add that. Um, and then you learn that, you know, I believe it's white flies that have to be present for that to continue to reproduce. Um, well, they'll, they'll, it's always a good day when your beneficial insect starves because it means they've eaten all their prey, right? And Swarovski are sold for white fly control, but they, and I do, you're right, it's been a while. I think that they might need that, well, they need a protein source to re reproduce, but nowadays one of the insectaries is selling Artemia, which is brine shrimp eggs with Swarovski so that they can continue to eat and reproduce. So that's what we were missing before is a, a protein source to kind of, because it seemed like those would be there, but you would have to, and those weren't cheap. Uh, so no, we well, and that's what, are you, what, are the, what is the, also, what's the purpose of the source key? What, you know, because early on with hemp russet mite, for example, we were over recommending the wrong predators. So, you know, it really was so wild west because it was a matter of who you got on the phone and what they were recommending to you. Yeah. And you felt helpless. So you were almost buying whatever. Because the secret to him is, is, is sulfur. I'm sorry. What about sulfur? Right. Not and uh, you've kind of spoken on that before about using micronized sulfur for certain things and how other companies will dress that up and then pretend it's something else. Yeah. Um, that's something else that I feel like a lot of the, the beginner farmers, they don't realize, they don't read the real part of the label that they should understand. Yeah. Um, to see what, what product they are buying, not just the cute yeah. little label on the front. And I have to be careful about how I make recommendations because uh, liability in every state is different. I mean, you got to realize I work with these guys that are could lose licenses if I give them the wrong information too. So going, going back to that approved list in every state is the safest thing to do. So was that elemental sulfur that you were talking about? Well, micronized. So 
it depends on how much detail you guys want to go into this, but in vineyards, they have an aerophyid mite, which is the same thing as a russet mite. And they do sulfur sprays to control the mite every spring when when the dormant woods uh, waking up basically. And so that's that's a foliar application, so not fogging or more just uh Well, and, and definitely be careful with fogging, but yeah, no, it would be in solution. Okay. Yeah. And what about sulfur? I'm not making a recommendation. I know, I know. <laughs> Micronized sulfur that turns into a gas though, right? It volatilizes, yeah. Yeah. And the hydrogen sulfide actually is what kills the mites. And that's what makes some people nervous using it. Like yeah, I mean, environment, failing tests, that kind of thing. Yeah, and really going back to it, what I, I guess what I was saying there is that sometimes simpler solutions are what work for pest problems. So instead of releasing a whole shit pile of Swirsky, you could have used something a little more effective, basically. And uh, so it seems like the best bang for buck when you're when you're talking overall health from beginning to end would be to use the hypiosis miles. Um, those don't seem to be as is expensive if you kind of do your homework and from that source it seems like you can pretty much um you know they, they'll they'll reproduce in a, in a quality environment yeah but the target is uh basically fungus gnats and thrip pupa for stradiolite they're that. going after yeah so what what can we use because aren't don't most um mites aren't they breeding in the soil system themselves and then crawling up the stalk it really depends on the predatory mite, right? So stratiolalaps life cycle is in the media, but uh, predatory mites are in the canopy generally because that, that's where their prey is. So can you kind of break down for us what would be the best part to put for the soil system in conjunction and then the best part to put in the canopy? Yes. Um, thank you. And I want to warn you guys too first, when we before we go into this, if anybody contacts our branch, my the lady that does my ordering, her name's Lori and she's a sweetheart, but um, sometimes it just takes a lot of support in terms of getting set up with us for beneficials. But once you're set up, you're in great shape. So for the soil, we have stradiolalaps and rove beetle are the two predatory organisms. And then for the, the canopy, you have a whole different assortment of predatory mites that are based on humidity. So I think in general, when growers come to me, we focus on the problem first and then the solutions. But a good foundation is in most environments, because you can do foliar applications of insecticides, right? And you can use stradiolalaps and rove beetle and they'll survive most applications. And then, uh, for example, if you have recurring thrips problems and your humidity is at 60%, cucumaris is a great option. And that's a more value predatory mite, correct? Well, it's a more cost-effective one because cost it's effective. yeah, yeah like it's bred in the U.S. and it's just uh, easy. I think it's easier to rear. I don't get in, too involved in production in, in sectories, though. But yeah, yeah, that one seemed to be pretty effective. So that was you know five minutes. That could have been an hour in terms of which beneficial insect to select. Honestly. Yeah, no, we like straight to the point. I mean, yeah. that, that's what we, you know, our viewers want to play around with that kind of stuff. And then we, we love to get information back, feedback uh, yeah. from them so that the community can t continue to grow. We don't waste our money on certain predatory mites or certain beneficial insects that just don't, aren't going to be as effective as we think, um, you know, looking through the magazine or being online. And the humidity I wanted to point out as well, that's not the humidity of the room. When you're talking humidity for at that level, you're talking about around the leaf area. Yeah, relative humidity. So if you wanted to get into the weeds, you'd want a, you know, a leaf wetness sensor. But that's, you know, uh, most people in the, in the real world, you know, growers come back and say, did it work? Did it not work? If it didn't work, maybe we try Swirsky instead. If your room's dry, you get the idea. That was the biggest issue too for a lot of us uh, we just would try everything all at once. So if certain things worked, it was like, okay, great. But what part of that new formula was working? Right. Yeah, exactly. It's all trial and error. I mean, that's, and it's, it's all crops too. Yeah. I think the big takeaway there is don't, don't be a moron. Just do one thing at yeah. a time and, and pay attention yeah. to if it's actually work. Yeah. That's yeah. Thank you. That was a good one. And that humidity is really interesting. I hadn't heard that before. Well, the eggs, so the cucumaris eggs will dry out 
and warmer so you don't get you don't get reproduction so it's a matter of your philosophy if you know they're not going to reproduce you know cucumeras are cheap then you just do weekly releases but if you want cy true cycling in a dry room then some swirsky would make sense what are some of the you know we love to play around with the minute pirate bug the assassin bug because it kills something throws it on its back that part's kind of cool are there other things that are you know we might not know about yet that you feel like hey play around with that in your greenhouse and see how effective it is and being proactive because that's really what we're being after today more is to uh, learn how to be more proactive uh, when combating some of these things that so we don't have to spray anything or uh, emergency things come up where you know sure. yeah i think scout well the real thing is scouting i mean right. uh, there are places like when i was at monrovia for example my full-time job was to go back and assess the crop and uh you know just earlier this week when suzanne and i were talking we were talking about yellow sticky cards one of the things people don't understand or the purpose of them is actually for monitoring it's not to catch the fungus gnats so your best defense is working ahead no matter which organism you're trying to control and then selecting the correct one. And I think what you were saying there about kind of what's new and you might not be aware of is probably that supplemental food discussion where, where the brine shrimp or other food is a source for them to be able to reproduce on the crop. Which is exactly what we're after. Cause if it could be not as uh, overbearing, uh, especially in a larger facility to want to shift to beneficials, but then when they aren't as effective as you were hoping, or the Swarovski seems to die out, uh, sometimes the the guys writing the checks don't want to do another round of rather pay yeah. pesticide. Yeah. Yeah, and I, uh, there's plenty of facilities that have walked into, and and we've just dialed back the beneficial insect program actually, and increased the the frequency of the right type of sprays. And that's the main reason Leighton and myself are here each and every Thursday is so that we can teach you guys how to grow healthier plants. And then you don't really have to worry about this stuff so much. Um, but as we're coming into the beginning of the grow season, a lot of people because of 2020 are now wanting to get more into growing. I feel like there's a lot more newer minds uh, that are wanting to get into this. And that's why I reached out to you, Mariah, because I want to give them the information from the source uh, so they don't have to go into a hydroponic store like myself, see a, an entire shelf of stuff that you really have no idea what it is. Uh, one of the other things I'd love to talk to you that was on that shelf um, when I first started farming was a product called Eagle 20. Oh, yeah. um, if we could kind of talk about that, I'd love for... Well, the funny thing about Eagle 20, by the way, is it's basically not used anymore in other crops for powdery mildew management. It's a cheap fungicide. And it actually will volatilize and um, you are more likely to contract or get Parkinson's from exposure to products like Eagle 20. Great. So, you know, the guy that's been smoking cannabis imbued Eagle 20, you know, there's the reason why they have a nervous twitch and it's because we've been selecting the wrong products out of ignorance the whole time. <laughs> well, I was looking at a farm at the time. It's really not. Yeah, I was working at a farm at the time where we were trying to educate them. And it was since it was all about profit, basically the answer was, okay, Brian, I understand where you're coming from, but we have to still sell all of this product. And we're still going to sell all of this product, even though we know uh, that it has been sprayed with Eagle 20. Yeah, well, that's, that's the onus on, is on him. And in other commodities, he would have gotten a lawsuit and potentially jail time. They got busted. They got hit by batch violations and all kinds of stuff. But that's what I want to give, you know, a warning out there to people too. The the shortcuts are very just that, very short lived. And if you build a brand and then you start to go back on some of the things that really helped you build that brand, I've seen that too, where organic, quote unquote, farms um, want to grow with a living soil system or want, want to have that in in mind. They have a few issues that start to pop up, and now they are using uh, pesticides and fungicides again. Yeah, and I, I work with the big commercial facilities and sometimes like within this last month, I was in Washington and they have recurring powdery mildew. And I said, well, let's look at the environmental charts. And, you know, if your temperatures drop below 70, you get powdery mildew. Now, I'd also heard um, that when you add heat to this, obviously from the flour, uh, once it's a finished product, that, that turns into cyanide. Yes, right? that's correct. That's the, the connection between... Uh, Parkinson's and cyanide. So for you new farmers out there, I mean, 
why the hell would yeah, you Yeah, exactly. And, I, and the traditional farmers aren't even using that, I mean. And I bring that up because I just, uh, I needed uh, some products for our uh, isopod thing. And I went to the hydroponic store and they still had that on the, on the bottom right uh, shelf. It was still Eagle 20 right there. Well, and I was going to mention on the, on the side of the hydroponics, right? I think there are some great grow shops out there that are working with me. My favorite example is Bloom Garden Supply in Portland, because what happened was we got such a great deal of growers in the Portland area that were contacting me directly. And I thought, well, let's just start giving, putting the right thing on your shelf. And then I'll refer the business to, to you guys. And so every time that, you know, the smaller grower contacted us, I'd give them the resource and then I was able to focus on other things too. So I think that I don't necessarily want hydroponic stores. I just want them to carry the right things. Yeah, and exactly. I, and to educate the consumer that there's an alternative, like yeah. just because this little row right here, that doesn't mean right. Like, there's a whole internet out there where you could learn about what, what you really need. And that was the path that I feel like uh, my team at the time we went down is just trying to figure things out on our own because once we started to go to the grow store and we took the time to start to educate ourselves, we started to see that our knowledge was starting to compete with theirs more from the living soil world. And then we started to see that they would just pitch us products basically that they made the most money on. And we didn't yeah. see that obviously at the beginning, but advanced nutrients, like, I mean, that's one product that I don't feel really bad about talking on because they ripped off uh, everybody in my, my peer group when we first started out. I mean, the, it was just, the products themselves were so overpriced and that's the kind of stuff that I want to minimize uh, for the newer farmers is you minimize the, the the nutrients, you minimize the amount of money that you're spending combating pests. And then if you can put a little money in your pocket, you can continue to farm. And that's uh, one of the other things that I felt like when I first started out is we had failures in farming and then we'd have to pay all the bills, the electricity and all that kind of stuff yeah. and then continue and start over, which is a huge gut check, um, you know, at, at least for us back then. I mean, it was it was really hard to continue. Um, we just, okay. everybody's supposed to make all this money, but here but we are cost, to figure it out. Cost per square foot is just going to go up too. I mean, it's just the nature of things and fertilizer could be a completely different topic. Believe me, because Wilbur Ellis is a fertilizer company before it is anything else too. So, so, uh, some of the other fun stuff, let's get back into more of the lighthearted. I, I feel like, what do you think about, um, messing around with the jumping spiders? That's kind of more come out. Uh, shout out to my boy Sasquatch503. He was one of the first ones when we were chopping it up a few years ago that was talking about that and how uh, it doesn't make a webbing and it is more of an aggressive uh, seeking type um, predator. Well, I like spiders in general. I mean, uh, in other crops, it's a sign of health because it means that you have not sprayed too much. So your insects population is naturally okay. As for jumping spiders, I really haven't done any real... This is the first time it's come up as a topic for us. So okay. I mean, to know. Well, we've but, got the gold nugget for you. That's something that I feel like you might want to learn on is um, yeah. it seems like that's when I was saying maybe new, new and upcoming. It seems like the jumping spider is something that the community is trying to learn more about because we would like to have more of a, a predator that's going to be aggressive and, and seeking things out instead of kind of just going more with a, a volume approach. Well, and it's all about behavior, right? So Swirsky actually hunt and jump. So, you know, it depends on what you're trying to control too. You know, there was something that popped up in the chat and I was going to ask the question anyways. Um, do you guys work with nematodes? Oh Lord, that's a subject. Right. So yeah, I, I work with nematodes from five different, no, I don't know. I don't remember how many suppliers, but again, you select the correct genus and species. So Steiner pneumofeltii controls thrips. Steiner pneumocarpocaps, you control shorefly. Um, you get the kind of idea. So well, I do a lot of compost making and I always get different types of nematodes, often uh, yeah. feeders, bacteria feeders, predatories. But I don't necessarily know if those predators that I'm getting are just uh, nematode eaters or are they also um, predators for some of these uh, soil borne? bug issues well and also you can also get bad nematodes too like dagger nematodes if you have sand in your soil so it's a matter of um 
well, in science, people specialize, right? So nematologists, their their whole life is studying that organism and selecting the correct ones for control. So, and that's really where I'm focusing is. Yeah, I'm kind of like. Yep, I use Steiner Nemoth LTI, you know, so on and so forth. The right product and then put on the right way. Yep, I agree. That's, that's always important. But yeah, and, you know, drifting back into, you know, healthy plants. Um, some of the, the interesting new work that's coming out of, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of redox potential. Well, I'm familiar if, if they're a fertilizer manufacturer, but I'm not sure. All right. So redox potential is, is the measurement of electrons. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Reduction potential, how, how much oh, something yeah. oxidizes. Oxidization is loss. Reduction is gain. Yes. You got it. Perfect. All right. So there's a lot of information coming out now as we're starting to, understand millivolts and uh, plant health um, and how they're related. And I've had some conversations with some people and it's, it's theory um, about, well, if your health, if your plant is so healthy and the soil system is so healthy, then they actually become kind of invisible to these predators. Like the predators don't even want to, or uh, the pests don't even want to play with them. Um, have you read up on any of that kind of information or do you have anything to share on that? Not specifically. I think uh, in general with reduction potential, it mostly has to do with water and ionization of water. So I think that what you're talking about could also be repellency too. Yeah. The, 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 the bugs, the, the pests don't want anything yeah. to do with it. Yeah. Whether it's a magnetic wave or whether it's uh, a smell or an odor, or a chemo uh, toxic type approach, but yeah. The, the, the pests just don't seem to bother these super healthy plants. So, it's you know, all about the vibes, man. What? It's the vibes. Yeah, right, right. So, you, you, are willing to go, yeah. you are willing to go out there. <laughs> it's that positive vibration, you know, happy yeah. employees, happy plants, healthy soil, well balanced. Um, when, I'm, when I'm not doing this, I'm, I do yoga, so I get it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So you do get it. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's something that like I would try to talk to Suzanne about and, and she'd be like, all right, put on your. That's on you. That's on you. I'm not I'm not bringing that up with her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what she, she would tell me. Put on your tinfoil hat, Layton. <laughs> what else you guys got for me? Uh, a lot of things, actually. So, you know, the main thing with. Uh, so we had a, a question about like broad mites um, for mm -hmm. what I had learned. Uh, it's the saliva that's in the broad mite that that's why you don't really see it until it's like, oh, shit, what the hell is this? And you need a yeah. trained eye kind of because it uh, for at least for us, we thought it was a deficiency uh, for a few weeks until we, you know, could could do some research and find out what that was. So I wanted if you could talk a little bit deeper on what goes on with the hemp russet mite, because it seems like it's so ferocious that. Uh, you know, a week in a plant's life is a long time. So if we don't really notice it for a week and then we have a week to, to try to um, digest what's going on and then a week to react, here we are, you know, three weeks, something like that. I and mean, that seemed like what what our team was facing. Yeah, so that's about scouting, really. If you see one hemp russet mite, you need to give somebody like me a phone call. What if you don't have the trained eye yet to know what a russet mite is? Then I think that that's where getting the right magnifier and looking at the image of it. They look like golden worms, basically. They're disgusting little creatures. Yeah, they look, I mean, they yeah. blew everywhere. You like. So you see, and so wind can actually cause the marginal, same marginal leaf curling that um, hemp pressant might does too. So the marginal, it's sign versus symptom. The sign would be marginal leaf curling, then, you know, looking for the actual insect on the leaf or the mite, and then kind of going from there. And because it's the saliva, the really the only way to be proactive on that is to do the scouting. Well, so the broad mites cause that uh, um, malformation because their saliva is toxic. Hemp russet might just cause leaf curling because they're directly feeding on the crop and they are profuse. So they they reproduce quickly. Thank so that's you. why that's if you cool. see one on the plant, that's when you got to do something about it as soon as you can and or get rid of your you know, people hold on to their mother plants for way too long. <laughs> well said. Yeah. Well, it's the value of genetics, which is all perceived versus real. Yeah, right. there's ways to preserve it without yeah. just having a, a diseased and fest pl plant in the middle. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, that was something else. So the the hemp russet mite, I was 
teaching myself back in the day that it's the Californicus that you're going to want to use on that one. Um, and again, we we didn't really know the difference between broad or hemp. I still didn't really know the difference until you just kind of defined it right there. So I appreciate that. Um, there is a there is quite a difference on that. So is the Californicus a, as a f effective um, since it's from what I understand, it's that only predator is cannabis. Um, Californicus actually is a pretty decent predator of spider mites as well. Spider mites. Yeah. So, um, and then there's other Andersoni is a predator of spider mites and hemp russet mite. Um, and I think there's another one. Oh, it's been a while. Gallandromus occidentalis. Occidentalis is another one. Okay. Can you go on to that one? Because I've never heard that before. So biotactics down in Southern California rears uh, occidentalis. We call them oxys for short. They're the only ones in the world that rear them. They do well in relative humidities that fluctuate. And uh, they're also, I use them in wine grapes and things like that too. So they're a predator of areophyid mites and spider mites as well. So basically you have three different predatory mites for hemp russet mite and spider mites. Do any of them reproduce or are yes, they, they all, yeah, as long as the environment's good and you haven't sprayed anything that'll kill them. Nice. That's a good so point. using the, the banker plants and that kind of stuff, getting mm -hmm. them to eat on the pollen. That's the trick. Yes. So banker plants for everybody. Uh, it depends. You know, you got to do everything with logic. No, but that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. it? That's logical. It's yeah. Like, mm -hmm. So they do hang around. They do yeah. Around buy them. Um, there was a mite that I heard you talk about. Um, I think it was like a year or two. Uh, the, a facilis. I'm probably yes. not pronouncing that. Yeah, that no, is it's okay. It's called phalasis. Phalasis. Sorry. Yeah. And uh, it's another predatory mite. It's actually native to the Pacific Northwest. It does well in cooler temperatures. So. Um, and again, it's another one that the vineyards use as well for that reason, because it's native. It was originally found in orchards in um, Canada, and they found that it was more resistant to insecticides than the mites themselves. So it was a predatory mite that was surviving the residual insecticides. What type of orchard was it? Was it apples? Apples. Mm -hmm. Probably like the Okanagan or something. Gotcha. Um, yeah, all these, I feel so fortunate to work with all these entomologists that specialize in these organisms, you know? Yeah, and we're fortunate enough to be able to ask you direct questions and get direct answers. Yeah. A lot of this research, even when you try to do it on your own, you're like, holy cow, like, I don't even know what that word fucking means. And then you got to go <laughs> research that. Yeah, yeah, it's so, true. It's true. Where and are the other, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off at all. I'm well, it's actually, you know, the beneficial insects are a big part of my life, but they have become, as I, my career develops, I find that most people need all the options, right? So, again, it's about problem solving. We can get into, it's fascinating how beneficial insects work and how they eat each other and things like that. But at the end of the day, like you said, you got to get your costs in line with profit. Yeah. I mean, at the commercial level, you know, it's just everything's so quantified. So if you make a mistake now, you've made that mistake like in, you know, five rooms or whatever. So yeah, uh, understanding what what really are effective. That's the kind of gift that I, I hope that Leighton and myself can give with with having you on the show today is to give the community so that they can have proper terminology, at least know a few Latin words to be able to Google so that it pops up uh, first thing. Uh, and continue that research because right. one of the main things that I've been a big proponent on is is trying to educate people enough so that they can keep their job as well. You know, a lot of us can get into certain situations, but then uh, there's a lot of uh, finger pointing and that kind of thing if things go wrong. So to understand really what's happening in a grow at a like at a large commercial facility, I truly don't see that many people with that skill set yet. Um, so that's one of those things that I want the community to to have as a whole, because that's one of the main reasons I feel like you can continue to prosper is if you're able to protect the cannabis plant as well as grow it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's totally true. That's a great way to put it, Brian. And uh, there's a question here in the chat for you. Um, what are your thoughts on diatomaceous earth? Well, it deactivates in water. 
So it's good as long as it's dry and it works really well for slugs. Does it do anything for uh, soil borne mites or worms? I, I would not invest as much effort in DE as other things for sure. Thank you. Yeah. GR420. <laughs> Question answer. See that direct answer? We were I just even invest. telling people that. It used to take uh, sometimes days to put up a question in a forum and then wait for somebody like you, Mariah, to answer it. And here you are. What does yes. that take you, four seconds? Well, I have a lot of conversations with a lot of people. You know, yeah, I know you're an encyclopedia. That's why I got you yeah. on the show. I know. I figured we could have these kind of conversations, break down a lot of the bro stuff, and then I'm sure the community is going to love picking your brain uh, because it's – yeah. You're no, you're a no bullshit kind of lady, and I hope you take that as a compliment. Well, oh, well absolutely. Run some, can't bullshit a bullshitter. Yeah, exactly. But the only we thing, don't have time to sit here and yeah. theorize on shit. We need to, we need what works. We need I to just, get to work with it. Right? I just right. hope nobody takes it personally if they ask me questions and I don't get back to them. I mean, it depends on the day how much I've got going on. So. Well, yeah, and I mean the DMs first. For, for me, I can speak for myself. I can't keep up with that whatsoever. Yes. Yes, and actually, my niece and her best friend do my social media for me. I want to mention? Oh, you are so lucky. Yeah, yeah. I mean that alone. Is, <laughs> yeah. you must, no wonder you were at the ocean the other day. Uh -huh. <laughs> with my niece, with my social media girls, actually. Yeah. Oh man, that's the life. Yeah. Nice. Um, so anyway, I'm working on an orchard right now, and I noticed there was a comment about ants. Boy, can you speak on ants? Because they protect all of these. Uh, yes, exactly. So they'll mine aphids. They'll do all kinds of stuff. I think when I work with growers in indoor production or if it's reasonable, just I recommend boric acid traps, which are just ant traps. What is the predator of an ant? Like every now and then I would get that. Like I'm not, home grow. No, I'm not too sure on that. An anteater. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're actually uh, on the orchard I'm working on. We're actually playing with um, fungal spores. Yeah, so mycoinsecticides are an amazing thing. And honestly, I mean, we just don't do enough. It's it's a Bovaria, Isaria. Um, it's all about making making sure the organism is alive. That's why I only sell EPA registered products, by the way. So if some some bro is selling you something that says it's going to solve all your problems because it's got spores in it. I'd be very skeptical because manufacturing, I work with all the best manufacturers in the country. You know, it takes millions of dollars to EPA register a product, but it's because they've gone through all the studies that they're supposed to. And hopefully they have quality control because unlike yeah, they do. products are, are a nightmare. Yeah. You just don't know what you're getting. And a lot of times, even some of the top companies I work with, they sent off to Efren to have a sport count. I mean, he's like, you got nothing. Everything yeah. is not viable. And Brian, how long do you guys normally air this for, by the way? Uh, our talk? Yeah, we uh, we usually go like two hours, to be honest, unless you're super busy. Well, I have to take a I'm supposed to take a Russian to lunch here in a bit, so I've got to check the time. <laughs> okay. As long as you can. We can, uh, we can rapid fire yeah. a few things. Yeah, let's, let, but I just want to warn you. I'm actually with my colleague, so I'm going to check with her as to what time we're going. Um, okay. So just wanted to keep you guys posted on that. My apologies, though. I didn't realize the, the duration. No, we actually usually go about three hours. <laughs> he was being nice. <laughs> well, if yeah. you want me to People come really back. People really get into this, Mariah. Like, so. If you want me to come back, I'll give you guys more time, too. No, we'd love to have you come back. So where are we at with questions, then? Well, the, the the main thing too that a lot of people would love to get through from the bro science is what to do about root aphids. There was something called I don't even know if I'm pronouncing this correct the Met fifty two or Metarizium anisophila. Yes. Yeah, it's, I have no idea. Even. It's produced by Novozymes. I think everybody said, "Oh, it's made by Monsanto. Don't buy it." But it was it was a good product for at the time, but it was an emulsifiable concentrate. It was made by Monsanto. Huh. Well, that's what they said. I mean. Oh. Whatever. Novozymes ended up with it. The thing about it was it was an EC, so it would burn the roots. And I could never separate the forest from the trees. Was it the metarizium that was working or was it the oil? So for my root aphid, quick and dirty root aphid management is Azagard and Bovaria tank mix together. Azadirect and Bovaria is a tank mix. Then come back with Isaria. People hate my answer because it's usually three-day intervals. So you're continuously drenching. But 
over time, that's what you have to do. And just like this last week, somebody sent me some Isaria that was doing a fantastic job in the capillary mats because the humidity was really good. So that's another thing about mycoinsecticides. You need the humidity, which in the if you're doing a great job watering, it's continuous. Those capillary uh, mats are a nightmare when you get infestations. Though. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, everything's got a drawback, but that was a good example of a mycoinsecticide working. There is no real wonderful solution to root aphids other than not introducing them. Right, and that's what seemed like the t two options you would always hear the quote unquote consultant say is you have that 52 product or you have uh, basically to burn the, the place down and start over. And I don't, yeah. I mean, there are times where you have to cut the, cut the cord on a crop, but then there's other, I have a wonderful grower in Canby that has a next gen greenhouse in the middle of a nursery. And you know, when you're, your your vents are open, then things are coming in from outside, but he's gotten smart. He, he knows exactly how much micro insecticide to use and how frequently, and it's really, it was a long painful process for him too. And sometimes I'll connect one rec grower with another just for advice so that they can kind of commiserate too. Yeah, because we a lot of us want to have the experience too. We want to hear somebody, you know, kind of tell us these certain things and then hear from a farmer that's gone through that, that's battled russets yeah. uh, and still was able to continue uh, with a perpetual grow. That kind right. of thing. Yeah. Is, oh, Will, Will Feetham, he's my buddy. Is will is PFR as a soil drench compatible with predatory mites? Yes. There you go, Will. <laughs> Short and sweet. He introduced me to Negronis, actually, if I remember correctly. <laughs> is that your That's cocktail of choice? That. It's one of them. Yeah. I, I went through a Negroni phase. Uh... It's also a painful hang a hangover, yeah. right? I mean, that's a lot of booze in that glass. As we get older, it's one Negroni. <laughs> I don't even drink anymore. I can't even have one of anything. Right. <laughs> uh, what about parasitic wasps? Uh, the the trigogramma. Yes, yeah, so trigogramma or a, a moth egg parasitoid. And, and what is that going to? Um, are, are you able to use that in a proactive setting? And what exactly is that going to do for us in a living soil? So if it's it works, it's specific to caterpillar. It's the world's tiniest parasitic wasp. So if you had caterpillar, yeah, and the rate's a card per acre. So, so with the parasitic wasp, you need specific, you need, you need to dial that in as well. Yeah, you think about it like a womb for, they're using the an insect as the ability to reproduce. So what would be, uh, are there any other parasitic wasps that would help a cannabis farmer? Because we don't really have the caterpillar unless we're outdoors. Yeah, so if it is Comana is a parasitic wasp, I'm asking my call. What time do we need to pick meet Isaac? Oh, um, noon. Noon. Oh, okay. So we got time. I've got until eleven thirty. By the way, guys, my time. Just wanted to make sure. You're you're on the Pacific Coast, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So it's our all right. My time too, and late in this yeah. time. But but actually, it's interesting because uh, like. Caterpillar have hammered outdoor growers down here oh, yeah. in SoCal and I assume yeah. up the coast. So kind of what what are some caterpillar prevention strategies uh, that so you're So two years ago, you know, remember, you guys remember when hemp was so hot, right? And people were growing it like mad and everybody had caterpillar in the crop. And so they, they'd call me and it was really easy. The solution is BT, Dipel is the product which is a stomach toxin or BT now is the other one. Um, and then trichogramma for the life cycle where the egg is being laid and the trichogramma lays the egg inside the egg and then you don't have caterpillar anymore. Same thing in vineyards with cutworms, same principle, but it's cheap. It's 20 bucks an acre for, for trichogramma. Damn. Yeah. I think that's why a lot of people were messing around with it, but if it's only going after a caterpillar, then we were wasting our money. Right? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. We had a lot of snake oil going on back in the day. And I think we're always going to work through it in one way or another. Still a lot of snake oil going on now, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> right. Doing this shit. <laughs> well, I guess at so. least for the living soil crowd, I feel like the majority of those at least know that 
there's a there's a drastic difference between something coming from a bottle and something that you are creating yourself. Well, my favorite there. is the fact that people are still buying hypochlorous acid. That's bleach, man. <laughs> there's a lot of things that in the, the hydro store, like I was saying, are just. Yeah. Um, uh, Duke Diamond was even teaching me some of that stuff of like he was like, look, this is basically cranberry juice and yucca extract. Yeah. Yeah, so I always, I, I think when you're working with anybody, no matter if you're in a grow shop or in agribusiness, you need to look at the active ingredient and really figure it out. Yeah, that's how you, if you obviously want to make more money in farming, then you need to know what is going yeah. into you, your yeah. inputs. And if you're not at that level yet, that, you know, none of us, or at least nobody in my world started out that way. We all started yeah. out actually using an aeroponic machine and, and running house and garden nutrients and flowering plants that were probably this big, um, you know, not making any money doing it. And I feel like for a lot of these people, they feel like because their grow is a little bit smaller that for whatever reason, that's not, you know, they're not being successful. But having successful flips, especially when you first start out, so you have money to continue the progress. Uh, in my opinion, that is the beginner's success. It's just to make sure that you have that perpetual harvest up and running uh, without major pest issues. And if you yeah. do have pest issues, because a lot of, I know a lot of people are starting to farm um, literally this week and next week in Colorado, um, that you need to reach out to somebody like Mariah so that you can understand stuff if things go um, haywire. Well, I got to say, I love you, Colorado, but your culture is very, very entrenched with the grow shop. Yeah, exactly. And we got a branch in Denver. I'm like, come on. We do. We tried uh we've tried a variety of things and maybe now because of certain aspects we can continue to have more of a voice. But yes, definitely in yeah. Denver, people used to laugh at us when we'd say, Well, our goal is to start to reuse the soil. Yeah. I'm like, oh, that's gonna run out of gas. You guys are basically idiots, you know. Boy, uh, so a, a lot of closed minded people in Colorado, but um I also feel that way latent with uh, your crowd down in California. Well, down here, I, I don't understand why they are. Where are you in California, Layton? Uh, down in Oxnard. Okay. So, yeah, I don't get it down here. I mean, Oxnard, you're at the coast then, correct? Yeah, yeah, I'm literally yeah. a stone's throw from the water. Yeah, so Salinas Look Valley. Hair. Thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely I, on the coast. You know, I just, I don't understand their, their like, refusal to stop throwing away their soil and stop using all these newts. It's just interesting. No, I, well, it's people insane. aren't going to like me saying this, but the best way to... Get fusarium is to use compost tea and recycle your soil. Well, if you have a healthy, balanced soil, fusarium is just part of it. I mean, right. fusarium, right? Yeah, actually, will turn into a, a beneficial if, if you have a super healthy living soil. Yeah. And then you don't have these bug issues. You don't have these breeding grounds because something's there to eat it. You know. Yeah. Of, so they, they'd rather spend money on salts and soil and you know all of these beneficials, which I just I don't get it. But, you know, who am I, right? Yep. At the end of the day, it's just people's bottom lines that we're, we focus on. Yeah, well, that's the problem. <laughs> if they were focused on their damn bottom line, they wouldn't be wasting all that money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. that's, that's the part I don't get. Like, it just, you know, maybe they're afraid to try it. And, you know, and again, that's why we do the shows is to make people understand that this is not complicated. This is actually really easy. Um, it's a commitment. You know, there is a transition period, but if you start blending, that's when you get in trouble. You start, you know, oh, but you're not growing good enough. Let me let me use some newts. Now you just fucked your whole living soil system up. And that's that's the problem is that, you know, once you get it going, you can't go back. And right. maybe that's the problem for these SoCal guys. People panic. But cannabis is a 16 week crop and in indoor production. So how much energy do you want to invest in mycorrhiza and things like that. It's well, the thing is, if you have a living soil bed, you do because yeah. everything is in play. But if you're in pots, you're throwing your money away once again. I think my favorite example in my career has been working with 710 Labs. Where are they out of? Uh, well, Oakland and Colorado because their, their living soil room, they dialed it in, but it was a long process. Shout out to uh, Sticky Lungs. He works at 710 Labs as well. Yeah. We uh, really respect what they And have. Richie and Saba. Yeah. Well, there was a grow that we did in Parachute that nailed it on the first grow. Yeah. And they never grew a damn cannabis plant in their life. Yeah. That's because we built the horizon soil system, hit them with AMOs, IMO3, IMO4, sat them up. And now they're just crushing it every run. And they're not they're not doing anything other than water only. And a little bit of uh, K&F or NF. 
uh, solutions. So, I mean, I know it's possible. Everybody's got this, uh, you know, a goal of plant health. It's just a matter of how you get there. Um, yeah, and your knowledge level. And for a lot of us, we'd rather use Mother Nature than try to get that, take the time to get to that PhD level to understand certain things. Um, it's just really hard to do, <laughs> to be honest. Wild high and deep, and I'm not. I'm not a PhD. I'm proud to actually not be one, honestly, because I've had so much field experience. That makes two of us. I'm all field and no book. No book. <laughs> white papers. Lots of white papers. No, I, so I got a bachelor's degree in biology, and then I studied viticulture, too. Yeah, it's. I mean, I feel like this day and age, that degree really doesn't define really anything anymore. It's you know what, what's coming out. No, of you know what? It, it teaches you critical thinking, which you cannot put a price tag on. That's for sure. Common sense. That's a rare. Yeah. <laughs> well, depends yeah. on what school you go to for common sense. That's true. Can Can you talk about maybe some IPM research you've uh, read recently and kind of what your aha moments were? Oh Lord. I wish I had time to read research to be honest. Like when you're when you're dorking out with other IPM experts, like who's talking about what like as emerging kind of Is this in cannabis? Or anything. Like like actually I, I'm interested in kind of the current state of uh, the wine industry and kind of what pest oh, pathogens are hitting one. them. Yeah. So what you they have their virus too. They have a leaf roll virus that's vectored by mealybug. And so what's going on in the Willamette Valley right now is a lot of the problems they have in their vineyard are coming from nurseries where there's a cultural disconnect. Again, it's the same thing with the cannabis industry. You get your genetic material from one place and you're growing it another. So you're introducing problems like that mealybug, leaf roll virus. Um, and we are working on field releases of cryptolemus, which is a, a predator of mealybug to reduce that pressure and organics in organic wine grapes. And I work in biodynamics with them. So you could imagine it's like organic, except even more OCD. Uh, I didn't know you were muted. That's right up to Gare's alley right there. If, if you can be over OCD about it, that's that's where he would like to be. Yeah, sit down. I mean, we should get some winemakers on here sometimes. Some vineyard managers, you guys should be talking to each other. I, I agree. Now, I, I in the past had tried to make some of those conversations work where like the idea of, of somebody who's focused on wine and someone else on cannabis just yeah. like shooting the shit. And yeah, I've got a buddy and his name's Carl. It looks like John Lennon. And we sit down and talk about all these biological things that are going on in the vineyard and how to make it all work. Yeah. So, but I guess that's the one that, that that's one that came to mind most recently. Another thing too was uh, cranberries. They have scale problem. We're working on insect growth regulators for them. Every week is something. So are you out in Massachusetts then? Or I've where, been. Where, where are the West Coast cranberries grown? Actually, Southern Oregon coast. Okay. Beautiful really? there. Yeah. That's interesting. I did not know. Yeah. Were you involved with the Department of Ag for a little bit up there? Yeah, I worked in their plant pathology lab. And what I learned was I don't have a lab personality. <laughs> I like to be out. So I, I learned, but what's great is I can reach out to them as I need them for questions. Something that stuck out to me from the Department of Ag in Oregon was a, re, you know, a report that they released maybe four or five years ago uh, where it was talking about soil inoculants, microbial inoculants. Yeah, they did a, a study of colony count and viability. A lot of people knock that. Uh, they were saying that it wasn't correct. Probably because they were selling those products. <laughs> right. So there are a few cannabis people on that list. Um, so I, I just wanted you to say, like, f your belief system is that for all intents and purposes, the, the tests were done correctly. And, and that I is the speak, data that was I can't shown. really speak for it yet. And uh, I think the woman I knew that was involved in that, Robin Rosetta, retired. But, I, you know, we could probably do some digging. But it's about col colony count viability. And it goes back to what I said about EPA registration, too. That's how you know they're legit is if they're at that level. I don't generally sell. Yeah, we don't sell non-registered products. Sure. Oh, it makes sense. Yeah. Blake, do you have some questions? Or you want me to keep firing I'm, away? Here, you sir? know, I'm, I'm like pondering, you know, a couple of these, you know, ideas of like, all right. Um, one of the things that we're uh, some other boys and I are trying to get together is is getting 
some more um, information and data out of this living soils. And I've been struggling to find um, people of perhaps your caliber that will will take the time to really understand like, all right, what is that relationship between this really healthy living soil and the the pest pressure from perhaps a neighbor or, you know, a, a drift of some kind? Well, everything is, we're never working a closed system. Everything comes from outside. Right. Exactly. And as soon as you are in a closed system, once that gets in there, now you're in trouble. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, human organism, same thing. We can do everything, exercise, take our supplements, get exposed to the, to something else and we get sick. I mean, we might be less likely to die, but so. It's that exposure that's the problem. Yeah. And, and, and let's face it, biosecurity and cannabis is a joke. These guys just don't understand that they're, they are the vector. They're bringing the shit in every day. Yep. So maybe you could talk a little bit about biosecurity and beat that into these people's heads because, you know, it's like crying in the desert. Nobody hears well, it. it's hard for me sometimes in some states to recommend good clone providers, but the ones I do work with um, go over the top with their um, practices for sure. So what she's basically saying is these clone producers are – super OCD about letting anything come in contact with them so that they're not, they're not the vector to sending out more problems to the growers. So that's, yeah, that's usually where it comes from, right? Yeah. Or, or, or cut. Have home grows that work in grows. And so yeah. they're bringing their own shit from their home into these facilities because they don't have a change of clothes. They don't you know change their shoes uh, or suit up one or the other. Um, you know, that's, in, in aquaculture, that's a huge thing. You got foot washers when you walk in the door. You have to change your clothes. So you have clean clothes at your facility that do not leave there. They get washed there and they get hung in your locker. And so you come in, you change, and you go to work. And that's something that the cannabis industry, especially you know these giant indoor grows, need to start doing um, because they're their own worst enemy. Yeah, I mean, there's guys showing up with the same hoodie on five days a week. Yeah, and after they go home to their own grow, it's fucking yeah. <laughs> they ain't yeah, There's a lot of uh, ways that I feel like companies shoot themselves in the foot, especially very well-financed companies shoot themselves in the foot. They just don't understand simple things like that. Well, that's because they're not hiring the right people in the first place. Yeah, because it's all about money. Cheaper is better, right? Yeah. I guess so. I mean, shoot themselves in the foot. You get a cheap quarterback, you're not really throwing touchdowns. Right. That's what I see a lot of these big commercial brands trying to do is get that cheap quarterback and then try to run a, a, a high-end offense. So do we have more questions from uh, your, your Rolodex there, Brian? Yeah, there's uh, – so the regalia for yes. powdery mildew, can you uh, kind of give your thoughts on that? I like Marone, and the thing about regalia is it – stimulates the plant's immune system to make it less susceptible to powdery mildew does nothing to manage the inoculum the spores so i'd like to introduce um other organisms like bacillus subtilis and amyliquifacians uh cease serenade triathlon are the three three products and then potassium bicarbonate which shifts the ph of the surface of the leaf to make powdery mildew less susceptible I can take a breath sometimes. Now you're spitting bars, you know, you got to get it out. So what about trigoderma? You like them? Yeah, as a as to the root zone to and prevent. As I consider it like a band-aid that covers the root to make it less susceptible, but that so does bacillus. So it goes back to the same thing. Understand your product, how you're using it, and what your cost is. Why is it what your goal is? I mean, man, Terra Grow is a great product. It's humic acid. And bacillus, kelp, 18 bucks a pound, something like that. Rate four ounces per hundred gallons. Well, that was my next question. What's the dilution? So four ounces per hundred gallons, that's that's good. That's not yeah. Good. That's the kind well, of stuff that the community no, it, needs it, to yeah, know. Days, it feels like writing a prescription, but really you want people to survive in terms of their business. So the best way is to focus on cost and efficacy. Well, and that combination is beautiful. So you got a chelator and the humic acid, you got a hormone in the kelp, and you got your 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 you know beneficial uh, bacteria to do the work. 
for you as well. So kudos to those guys. That's a hell of an idea. Little product. Uh, Peter, why don't you throw that up on the screen? Just so the audience can get it. I throw what on the screen? Uh, just the name of that product that she was just talking about. Uh, the ter 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 yeah, no, I was on. Uh, I'll pull up the biosafe. Uh, hold on. All right, here's your gold nugget, gang. Get your Whoops. pencils out. Making me do things while I'm high. Uh, <laughs> hold on. It's going a little what slower. Is this right. I'm the most sober person here. I think I need to start having, doing this with some whiskey or something. <laughs> yeah, whiskey. we hold no judgment here. The Negroni. Yeah, next so time you can come. We, well, we can come oh, back. We, we can do five o'clock cocktails. Uh, there you go. We'll all drink a Negroni. There you go. I'm with you. So, Terragro, that's coming from uh, our friend Zach over at Biosafe Systems. Well, I want to mention I'm actually at Sarah Brockman's house right now. She's the Pacific Northwest rep. Oh, right on. Yeah, I was coming back through. And so you should see I'm petting your dog right now, who's adorable. <laughs> this is a small world, huh? Yeah. Yeah. She and I both work in ornamental horticulture. That's how we became friends. So, and yes, Zach's Colorado, Max Gillies, California. All great guys. Nice. Yeah, uh, Zach's been a friend of ours for a while. Nice. Uh, when you're talking about spraying products and that kind of stuff, you know, it seemed like before people would say, ah, there's no problem with neem. Um, now that we're getting more to the wanting to create such an elite product, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, spraying neem, foiler feeding neem? Or, or just uh, oils in general. Yeah, just oils in general, exactly. Well, I think that the thing about azadiractin is that it breaks down over time. So it's about manufacturing. If you're purchasing azadiractin that's made in India, by the way, it could have some entourage of other, other types of insecticidal residues on there too. So, um, it's a, so again, it goes back to manufacturing. Um, the neem product itself has a bunch of different types of analytes, but... The reason why we focus on the azadiractin is in neem is because it's a repellent and insect growth regulator. It's also a biocide too, which is not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they don't tout that quite as much, but yes. So I guess that kind of covers neem and azadiractin. As for hyperemesis, don't have a full understanding other than it seemed to come out a lot in California around the time that people were going from into transitioning into recreational. So I question if there weren't a lot of other insecticide res residues in there as well. People oh, the kind of feel like the neem is, is changing the flavor of um, the full genetic profile that they're trying to achieve, especially if they're pheno hunting something and they're spraying neem. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I can't really speak for it. I'm not too sure. I mean, anything that's got some additional plant compounds on the surface of the root, the, the, the plant, I mean, you could do the same thing with a cinnamon compound, for example. Okay. Or grow. anything on there is going to be, yeah. that's when. I have guys that don't spray anything and kudos to them. I'm glad they do. Don't, I mean, but it's a long process. And those guys are indoor purely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that again is the problem. One guy scored in Washington. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Check them out. I will for sure. Yeah, it's the one problem with the indoor. You just can't get those natural, you know, balances of, of us and uh, predators. Yeah. Unless you're unless you're releasing them. So. And you're spending a lot of money usually. Yeah. That going. Well, if you do bankers and stuff, you probably can cut back. But again, if you're not providing food source or a place for them to breed, then yeah, you're shooting yourself in the foot. For sure. Now, that's the problem with indoors. They're just you really you're 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 trying to create this perfect and sterile environment, and you know, that's that's when you get in trouble. So any more questions up there, Brian? For her? Uh, yeah, when it comes to the micronized sulfur, when someone's kind of you know at their wits end and going to use that, but they do want to continue with a perpetual grow uh, with beneficials. What do you think that time frame would be like? two weeks, a month? Where you know what's awesome about working in vineyards? I emailed the entomologist there and I said, so how long does um, sulfur residue affect predatory mites? It's only 24 hours. Okay. So you can literally do a spray and reintroduce the correct predatory mite, almost back to back. In a practical sense, usually people do the sulfur application the week before the beneficial insect release the week after. What other combinations of, of 
uh, natural pesticides uh, that people use um, have that interaction where if you don't, if you release too early, you're going to kill off your, your beneficials. I think horticulture oil is a really good example because it's broad spectrum. Pyrethrin, pyganic, because it affects the nervous system so it doesn't just discriminate. The goal, the really good example of uh, ecological balance is Bovaria in combination with thrips predators like Swirsky, they work well together. Nice. So um, the horticultural oil, how long is that, that residue left behind? It's not so much residue, it's mode of action. It suffocates, so it's not going to dis discriminate. It's not going to be say, oh, well, you're a predatory mite. I'm not going to kill you. Yep. So how long does that roughly last? Or does that depend on the amount of you put on it? Not if the residual isn't so long. It's just if you have a predator on the leaf, then they're toast. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. So it's more about if you have a, a, a complete horror story showdown where you're completely uh, infested, you knock them down with horticulture oil and wait a week and then release your beneficials, something like that. Okay. Yeah. There you go, gang. Brian, any more you got? Fire away, brother. Uh, yeah. So this is from our, our buddy again, Terp Fountain. Uh, he, he has a question that you, you kind of answered. I don't know if you could maybe add to it. So he's asking establishing and maintaining predatory mite populations indoors. Uh, and then he, again, probably had the same mindset I did about uh, how do you get ladybugs to, to hatch, to, to reproduce for the larvae? I'm, gonna, I'm trying to be diplomatic Keep by not releasing out. ladybugs. <laughs> <laughs> by buying lacewing and having alyssum in your indoor grow instead. So just don't even go that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that gets me to something we talked about a couple weeks ago. Didn't we talk about kind of flower pollen as a or, or sources of food for the predators kind of in between an abundance of prey? to keep them right. around yes I yeah mean, we've talked on that i feel on multiple shows of really trying to get that up um but again it wasn't from somebody of her caliper you know that's that's something that i really like is that you're you're able to cut through again through all that bullshit and just tell us yes this is correct or no uh, that doesn't work well so can you just quickly specifically hit on what are some alternative food sources for predators that to maybe keep around yeah, so brine shrimp, like we were talking about the Artemia, pollen, uh, BioBest sells Typha, which is cattail pollen, of all things. Um, so there are multiple additional food sources for predatory organisms and the nectaries on flowers, too. Is, so there, a, is there a handbook on any of this? Like, uh, Yeah, I think so. I can send some resources when I have time. Uh, I think there's a handbook of Northwest. Oh, anyway, I'll send it your way. It's been a while. Cool. And then we'll post it up here on, on yeah. the show so that people can get it. Because, you know, that's the best thing in the world is being able to e either harvest wildcraft, harvest your, your own local sources, grow your own local sources, or if necessary, purchase, but purchase something that has you know, value, not just a brochure. <laughs> So thank you. Exactly, Layton. Making an educated purchase. Mm -hmm. We bitch about all the time. It's like, do you guys even read the fucking label on this shit? Like, you know how many products on Omri uh, have urea in it and they're yet certified organic? I mean, it's insane. So if you don't know your source, you better. <laughs> Bottom line. Uh, we have another question from Organic Matters. Uh, he wants to know how to breed and maintain neem populations. So neem is derived from the neem plant, which is grown in India. Yeah, it's a tree. <laughs> it's not a. It's not an insect. Do you mean yeah. nematodes or neem? Well, he wrote beam. He wrote B E M E. I think. He probably yeah. meant nematodes. He had to have been. Okay, probably maybe. Well, in general, when it comes to nematodes. being able to read your own anything, it takes a lot of work. Yeah. Leave it to the entomologists or whomever. I, in my opinion. Hey, do you think that those those predatory nematodes would breed in a healthy soil system, or are they just gonna? Oh. So they're they're disgusting, by the way. So usually they need a host to reproduce, right? Yeah. Well, I think they use wax worms, if I remember correctly, to rear uh, nematodes. Yeah, in. yeah. I mean, if you want to go down that path, 
if anybody, anybody wants to, that's their thing, man. Yeah, so it's like the guy. Predatory right, organic. Predatory right, yeah. walk. The yeah. worst smell of my life is I've ever experienced was was in an insectary because they they rear fly parasites and it's just like buckets of maggots. So yes, that's that's or, if that's if you want to have repulsive smells. Oh, and then sticking your hands in them and picking yeah. them up—it's crazy. Yeah, the the god gentleman I work with here uh, in in Ventura has an insect. Yeah. I've been up there and he breeds those predatory wasps and it's nasty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's it's interesting for sure. Yeah, different world. Thanks, but no thanks. Yes. Um, another question from our friend Professor Bluntstash. Um, I think it was maybe three weeks ago we had Dragonfly Earth Medicine on the show. They were talking about um, heat treatments for russet mites, uh, basically taking the room to 120 degrees, I believe. Um, so he was asking, would you be able to elaborate on heat treatments or other novel methods uh, to combat those kind of uh, pest issues? Well, I have a story. And, and before you answer that question, do you and Professor Bluntstash cross paths in the academic circles sometimes? Um, is that a... I, it's a joke. I'm joking. I, 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 <laughs> I was going to start to be like, oh my God, I see that dude at, in, the, yeah. in the halls of University of Oregon. Yeah, for sure. We're like, we're homies. Um, do, you, do you like all the weed names? Yeah. I mean, to each their own, right? Um, so the question about heat treatments, I'm smiling because early in my career when I was advising in cannabis, I had a grower that was trying to do his heat treatments and was literally like the place was practically burning down and he was trying to save his crop at the same time. So imagine the liability of me advising somebody on increasing the heat in their room. I, I, I mean, good for them that they did that, but so yes, heat kills organisms for sure. But um, we had used steam chambers to, to kill pathogens in pots, uh, you know, in, in large scale nurseries. And what you do is you put whatever you want to heat treat inside that shipping container, close it up and then use that steam sterilizer. So that's the horticultural application of heat treatment. As to how it controls insects, nobody's really studied that. And I can't imagine somebody in a big indoor grow trying to get it up to. Well, no. Right. I mean, in a green. Well, yes, they're doing the opposite. They're managing their HVAC to keep those temperatures as even right. as possible. Exactly. That would be insanity. But in a greenhouse, yeah. you can do it because you can just open everything up when you're done. Yeah. So I think that buy a steam chamber and use it to clean your pots because that's what you really you should be doing if you're using heat. Yeah, exactly. Applications you need to be using it for the correct application. Yeah. Are there certain nutrients that when there there's too much of them are attracting specific pests? Yeah, because too much nitrogen makes leaf, leaf tissue hot, soft, so it's easier for aphids to feed, for example. And that's the reason why. That's what's happening biologically. Yeah. And then yeah. phosphorus, calcium, magnesium imbalances can stress the plant out and just make it more susceptible to insects. We love cannabis, loves phosphorus too. I mean, we got it. You guys are loaded hard, man. Yeah, a lot of morons out there just dumping shit on them. The other day up here, just going, what are you guys doing, man? You just well, one amendment works late, and so seven should be better. Yes, exactly. And it's uh, another a friend of the show of ours, Mindfully Rooted, he wanted to know for just like a home grower, IPM considerations for somebody that's growing, uh, you know, in a, in a tent or just uh, in a basement at, at their home. One more time. IPM considerations for the home grower. So in a tent, in a little tent. Yeah, in a tent or a small basement grow. Well, not, and not introducing infested crops, first of all using the correct, I mean, it's the same principles. It's just on a smaller scale. So, and that goes back to working with the grow shop that can advise you well and purchasing EPA registered products. Um, I mean, that really summarizes it. Well, horticulture oil is cheap and goes a long way. Be mind if so, there's no correlation between cost and efficacy in cannabis. Okay. So a, $300 bottle of, of um, plant-based oil is still plant-based oil. It's not going to solve all your problems. 
So buy it at a horticultural store, not a grow shop. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I don't like to, the idea. Like I said, I mean, I would prefer that the people with smaller gardens still, they just need the same resources, you know? It's a pain in the butt to set up an account with Wilburellas. Because we're used to, you know, a thousand acres. So that's where, you know, you, you, you go to the right places that just have good resources. Yeah, but again, you can go to garden shops and pay right. half the price versus yeah. the bottle shop or the grow shop. Yeah. Which I always try to tell people is, you know, look, there's other industries growing plants. You know, go outside of your... your oh, company. yeah. 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 I mean, I, I work with the hanging basket producers that all stocked all the beautiful plants for your moms, you know? Uh, that, that brings us up to another question, Mariah. Uh, with, you know, the diversity of the people that you've been working with, what are some of the common things that you see? Like, is everybody's battling a certain um, bug where if your grow is next to this kind of yeah. uh, industry? It's a perennial problem. Everybody's got them. Drips are a problem in all, all commodities, except for wine grapes for some reason. You know, um, insects, really when it comes down to it, there is a disconnect between the amount of time people have to research things too and when they can make a decision. So that's where working with the correct consultant also helps so that you can say, I have this problem, please help me. Absolutely. <laughs> Otherwise you're just guessing. Uh-huh. Yeah. And throwing money out the window. Yeah. But I, the difference is that like in ornamental horticulture, they can use synthetic chemistries. But they've also used all the miticides on the shelf and they have resistance. So, yeah. Can you speak a little on what's going on with resistance? I mean, it's a, it's a big deal. It's a real issue. Well, I can speak from a practical standpoint, which is when one of the Wilbur Ellis reps that works with, I don't know, uh, somebody that grows roses and they've used all, everything they possibly can to kill the mites on the roses, then they call me. So it's just a fact. In other words, there's only so many insecticides out there. The chemistries are not novel so much anymore. Um, that's pretty much the summary of it. All right. I got one from left field for you. Okay. You ever heard of nanobubbles? Um, Here we go. No, but I know what nano means small. Right. So nanobubbles are bubbles that are less than 100 uh, microns. Or excuse me, uh, nano. Uh, fuck, is that uh, fuck, I lost it. But anyway. A very small but size. The boys got five minutes, so. Okay, very, very small. Anyway, this guy that I've been working with, I've been screwing around with this technology to preserve biology. So by increasing the dissolved oxygen in the water column of living Bio, uh, biological compo composter or, or extracts, I can increase the shelf life of it. So <clears throat> this gentleman screwed around with CO2 and introduced CO2 into this nano bubble or major. But you can't change the structure of CO2, right? CO2 is on the well, one side. So you're micronizing it, like somebody just said, you're making something smaller. Yes, so, exactly. I'm used to learn technology. My cells are smaller organisms, just like in plants, right? It's as small as it gets. So, so in general, no matter what the product is, if it's really small, then you get more surface area. Correct. Correct. And so anyway, he's he with surfactants too. Say again? Surfactants, like, you know, spreader stickers, that sort of thing. Yucca extract. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, what this guy has done is he, he introduced or injected CO2 into this uh, bubbler and produced CO2 water or CO2 nanobubbled nano, nano water. And yes. he sprays it on the insect, and it, like you said, it acts like a surfactant. It just knocks them out. But unfortunately, you're killing good and bad. I just wondered if you'd enter, ever heard anything like that. I have not come across it, but I've worked with people that have talked to me about micellar technology before. Okay. And it does the similar thing, right? Yeah. But it, again, the problem is it kills everything. So that's, you know, that's my fear is you get this into the wrong person's hands, and you're killing as many beneficials, beneficials as you are. Past, which is a bad thing. Well, sometimes people need to wipe this slate clean as well. So. Yeah, but that's that would be an application for this. Yeah. But, you know, like I would not use it on the orchard because I have so many beneficial bees and everything else buzzing around. 
um, even though we have the ants that are that are detecting the scale and, and all the other uh, pests, um, we're dealing with the ants first and then we'll go to those. But, you know, I could have knocked everything down, but it's, again, I don't want to do that because we're just trying to build the beneficials back up. So it's a dangerous technology to say the least. For sure. All right, uh, Brian, any other questions before we lose her? Uh, no, since she's got to go, I was going to let the audience maybe get a couple in. Yeah, sorry about this. Um, Oh no! no you're busy. Okay, we we can do part two another day. Yeah, so, I'm fine with we, that. We can do the properly Negronied out uh, yeah, episode yeah. where everybody is <laughs> five good, o'clock, good and liquored up. <laughs> so I think, I think a while ago someone asked, "Do do you also smoke weed?" Yeah, I mean it's a little bit, but I'm also a mom, so I'm a I'm dad. A <laughs> no, so I always Brian's say, a dad. No, I always say nothing ruins a high like an eleven year old. Uh, i love it because i love getting down to my kids level and being like we're in the same zone right now great (laughs) so you're listening to their stories what's that listening to your kids stories when they're high you're actually like listening to them yeah i will say i was i grew up in the central valley of california you know when, when cannabis was absolutely terrible so but i i spent my time in northern california too I was going to say, you, you should have smoked the brick we we did back in the day, yeah. back east. It was all seeds. No, I enjoy cannabis, but really my, my goal isn't, it's not so much about consumption. For, to me, it's about advising. Somebody's brain's got to work, boys. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> I, hear you. I, don't, I don't I only smoke at night after after hours because I, yeah. I, I don't want to be fucked up. You know? It's not comfortable. Especially when I have too much going on, you know what I mean. But I mean, I and maybe somebody out there can help me a little bit with this as we're discussing things. I just came from uh, spending time with firefighter family, and the one of the wives of the firefighter, she's struggling with uh, lung cancer right now. She lives in Arizona, and she's looking for the proper therapy dosage and product and you know I, I think it's a good thing to be part of a community right so we can get answers like these sometimes so maybe um, that's something that you guys can put forth as well for well Leighton I think you specifically yeah. can help her out on that yeah I can just hit me up DM me on Instagram yeah and I'll put you in contact with Pauline and she'll help you out yeah yeah because uh especially being in Arizona where and a lot of people are conservative too I'm not a conservative person I just you know, people love the idea of CBD, but they don't fully understand that you have everything needs to work together. So. Yeah, and CBD is only good for a certain part of it. Right. It yeah. can cause yeah. apoptosis and cancer. So without without THC, you ain't gonna get what you need. Yeah. So please, if you want to, either of us go back and forth. I I would enjoy a recommendation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, just hit me up. Yeah, and, and, and any anybody else who wants to get in touch with Mariah, just hit her up on Instagram. If anybody uh, wants to get in touch with Zoe and Michaela, I'm just kidding. <laughs> on this specific topic. <laughs> Again, you are so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, Peter, were there any uh, a few questions that the I audience? Green Goddess had one in there. I thought Green I got. Started- uh, recently, or do I have to scroll back? Yes, I mean, yes, yes. Yeah. What was the question um, that week? Yeah, I'm scrolling. No. Mariah, are you speaking anywhere this year? I'm, uh, you talk about in person? Yeah, I like an expo. Not right yet, there. not yet. Um, I'm going to be doing, I'm on a panel with Biopesticide Industry Alliance at the end of the month, and that should be a good one. Uh, because it, we're talking about manufacturing of biopesticides. So. Um, but really, I travel. I mean, most of the time, I'm just visiting growers. All how, did, over the how did last year work for you? Did you just Wonderful. Show? Actually, because I, I spent more time in my office and I was able to advise people. So you did everything. Does well, right. Mariah get bothered by folks who don't understand IPM as a holistic approach and instead confuse it with simple reactive pests? Eradication. I think what bothers me is the same thing as what bothers everybody else. People that just are want to be spoon fed. Okay, because my time, everybody's time is valuable. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so if I just gave you fifteen minutes of my time and then you say, "Can you text that to me?" I'm like, "Get a pen and paper out. <laughs> Gotta go." <laughs> 
So that's, it's not really, I think that's, or another thing is stubbornness, which can be any farmer. Yeah. I get that a lot in horticulture where they like, we release those predatory mites. It didn't work. And I'm like, well, it didn't work because of these three factors that you didn't consider. Yeah. There's a hard line with that from the, the individuals that pay for it. They're either all about it or, or not, you know, yeah. they don't, there's no middle ground with that. Yeah. And I'm totally comfortable saying, then, well, then keep spraying <laughs> if that's yeah. what makes you happy. I think a, a good grower is always learning and always willing to learn and always willing to uh, put their own ideas up to scrutiny. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I am so fortunate to know the people I work with. And, and we found the question. Thank you, Green's Got Grips and how to get rid of them. Well, first identifying them. Um, and you can do that by putting them in, catching some and putting them in an alcohol vial and send, submitting it to the entomologist in your state because a lot of times people think they have Western flower thrips, but it could be something else. And then uh, each state has different regulations, but introducing soil predatory organisms to get the soil pupation stage, if it's Western flower thrips, because then you're interrupting the life cycle. And then thrips also live on the leaves and they have multiple life stages. So the simple cannabis um, thrips, I don't know what the word is. Prescription for me is early in flower tank mixing as a guard bio series, introducing stradial laylapse rove beetle. Once that residual goes up, goes away, you flip into flower. You can use like sachets of forest gear, cucumeris. And then just rinse and repeat. Yeah. And, but monitor with your sticky cards and things like that too. Uh, Mr. Toad yeah. had a great comment. Shout out Mr. Toad. Uh, that's why it's called growing. <laughs> that's right right you're growing with everything yeah. yeah what's up mr toad always good to see you bud yeah B deep love and respect brother and i you know i do want people to understand i'm not trying to be snarky towards any the culture of cannabis i think that it's just our goal ultimately is just to use the correct product product and prevent exposure of toxicity and things like that i mean the more we learn as a group, the better off society is. Yeah, and we're, hope, we're hoping someday cannabis leads the world to opening their eyes to more living soils and more earth friendly practices. Because, you know, you've, you've been in the friggin' ag industry, you've seen what goes on. It's insane. Well, but they all have the same goals if they're an organic farmer with their yep. heart and soul in, in it. It doesn't matter what they're growing as much as trying to get the system as close to the Garden of Eden, frankly. Yeah. And that's where we need to go back to the garden and stop using all this shit. Like we are, I mean, I'm out here in Oxnard. It's insane. Yeah. The soil. It's just how, insane. How about this with the wine industry itself, just as another interesting industry, are, are you currently happy or sad in terms of your understanding of the direction, the overall general cultivation of, of grapes <laughs> is going? Well, I mean, like, is it going in a more organic, sustainable way that makes you happy or consumer, more? It's consumer driven. It's marketing driven. Right. So a great example is that uh, early on in the Willamette Valley, we had 400 wine labels. You know, when David Lett came up with his suitcase clones from from Europe and planted the vineyards. Right. And then the uh over time you know banking drives everything so people that have access to more wealth have access to more volume of production and marketing so the guy some of the guys get squeezed out but then you still have craft too so i have faith in craft and but i think that marketing is just a big part of why a consumer purchases certain things then how about other kind of you know, grocery store, like someone's talking about uh, strawberries in the chat, like strawberry production, which is big in SoCal. Do you, do you view it as trending in a positive direction or in a like, like, because I feel like more consumers in grocery stores are like, I want, I'm looking for organic. I will pay slightly more for organic. I think, I think vertical gardening. Sarah's or, talking to me. No, vertical gardening. Can she come on? Yeah, come on. So we want to see Sarah lurking off camera. <laughs> Come on, no. Sarah. Prove it. Don't be shy. 
Hi. Well, well, hi. Here's my yes. Here's my. Oh, she doesn't yeah. want to be on camera. No, you, yeah. <laughs> oh well, I I was just gonna say that um, I see a ton of CEA controlled environmental ag from strawberries to lettuce to herbs tomatoes. Um, and British Columbia in Canada is a great example of being successful with, you know, integrated and in, in vertical farming and cropping. In fact, in Lacey, Washington, about 15 minutes from here, there is a new 20,000 square foot facility that's pumping out greens and herbs. Uh, so I think in every major city, you're going to start to see these indoor growers coming on board with um, food. So, yeah, I think that's like, like vertical farming. But but then the way they're producing that stuff, do, do you view it positively? Or are you like, oh, my God, they're doing toxic stuff or chemical stuff? Oh, or, the carbon footprint type deal. Or or just any, any way you, you measure it that either makes you happy when you look at what oh, the trends okay. that are happening yeah. or sad. OK, well, this is what makes me sad. We all know that when you eat a greenhouse grown tomato or strawberry versus something that's grown in the field, it um, doesn't taste good at all. And that's because, I mean, a lot of these, they're growing them um, in water, you know, charged water, slimy, disgusting, dirty, charged water. I have seen some absolutely disgusting hydroponic um, facilities. So that is one thing. Um, and then the other is in order to keep these running, you pretty much need an engineer uh, on staff because it's, it is an extremely specialized way to grow and you have to have additional expertise in order to pull it off. And as far as um, toxic type things they're using, I think it's relatively, a lot of them are closed system. I think they're clean. Um, I think they're energy efficient. I think there is a very big chance for um, foodborne illness contamination with some of this, which again is why you have to be so careful and have the right staff. So that's kind of what I'm seeing. I think it's exciting and people will begin to fine tune it because a lot of things from the cannabis industry are coming over to conventional horticulture and things like um, CEA. And we're borrowing things from you and you're borrowing things from conventional horticulture. So I think that's just going to continue and improve both. Amen so. to that. Amen to that. That's Thank you. Yeah. Well, do, do, oh, I was going to say, do you both have to go pick this person yeah. up? Sure. Oh, yes, actually, we do. We do. We <laughs> I was going to say one of you could stick around, but uh, <laughs> we'll let you go. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I'll, I'll bring Mariah back. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's we'll, nice we'll to see close. all of you. Thank Bye. You. Thank you for participating. No problem. We have too much fun together, you know, Sarah. And <laughs> we travel together and do all kinds of great things and work in every every commodity together. So yeah, we need to get both of you on next time because I, I could drill you guys with questions. Like I, that's what I'm curious about, just kind of what you're seeing overall trends in, in different crop types and oh yeah, I know, mean, I think things that are happening that you think people should know about, good and well, bad. I think Brian, you've created a really good opportunity for us to interact on a larger scale with more more people and talk organics in general and i think we're all driven by the same thing so i i definitely look forward to more opportunities to connect with you guys well we, yeah, we, uh, we want to create some of those opportunities to give people like you the voice uh to continue yeah. to educate yeah nice well, I, I, I think you guys' discussion may continue. And if you have any relative, relevant questions later on, you're welcome to reach out to Zoe and Michaela. <laughs> Tell thank Zoe you. and Michaela hi. <laughs> Take care, guys. All right. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. You, All right. Bye. You know, uh, Brian, I do have a friend that's running a uh, very large scale uh, robotic lettuce factory in uh, Ohio, Illinois. Um, who has a aquaculture aquaponics background um, and is a chemist. So if you're interested in that type of direction, I'll reach out to him and we'll get him. Yeah, let's do a tour of the facility. That'd be amazing. Yeah, that'd be awesome. What he's doing is badass. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah. That, that's yeah, why for me, I'm always like, I, I don't care if there's no 
you know, cannabis talk in the conversation. I think it's just stuff. If it's interesting and people are learning and finding value, like that works. That's really how we all started. Peter is nobody was saying the word cannabis. They would just use the word tomato or I know. Wasn't that crazy? (laughs) And, And ironically enough, the tomato plant is a heavy, heavy feeder, just like the cannabis plant. Yeah. Um, Chip and I tried to come up with a formula or, or what we want to call um, a level bar for soil where it should be uh, chemistry wise when you plant it. And we started looking at different cultivars and how they pull different shit. And it was like, fuck it. Let's just look at the tomato plant. Use the tomato plant as your foundation. Test test, and, or, or amend till you get to that level of nutrition and then test after and amend it. Because it's just too, it's impossible, man. They're breeding so much so quick in so many different directions, and they all use uh, different components of the soil. So it's it's a bitch. We gave up on that project. I think it's also excellent to learn from people that are doing large-scale anything. Because when I was first learning, some of those guys were talking about, well, we got to make two pe- you know, two cents per plant, and that, that right. kind of shit. Yeah, yeah that's uh, Suzanne Bugley he talks about all that all the time. Horticulture is sometimes less. It's a, a penny a fucking plant, which is like, what the fuck, man? That's crazy. And all the amount of materials they're using to make that one penny, all the right. plastic pots, the soil, the peat moss. Oh, it's freaking horrifying. It's just horrifying. But, well, on a, on a positive note, my tomatoes are exploding outside, which makes me very happy. Well, there you go. What, what are you feeding them? <laughs> yeah, I would, I would imagine at this point you could probably dial in tomatoes pretty well, Peter. Uh, mostly uh, compo- I put layers of compost from the composter on the top. And, okay. uh, and uh, that's mostly it. It's so like, just- like, like Because I need to find, you know the compost comes out and I need to find places in my garden for it. So it's almost like a squirrel stashing stuff. Cause, uh, and, and, and so I, I put it on top of my raised beds and, uh, cool. you know, I make new beds with it and, but I still have excess, but I, I put a whole layer on the, uh, two by four bed with some tomato plants in it. And, uh, and they're very healthy right now. So, and that's probably all you'll need for the season. And I guarantee you, they're going to taste amazing. Oh, they do. Yeah. No, I, I, I made, I made Gemma's sandwich today. I sliced some tomatoes in there, salami, yeah. provolone, some arugula, and tomato. Nice. Which, <laughs> which I always like, I, I always make these amazing lunches for, and I'm psyched. And then she comes home and she's taking like one to zero bites of it. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Into the compost pile. <laughs> right. Now, then I eat it. and uh, But it's also at like the end of the, you know, I make it at like 7.30 in the morning and then I eat it at 4 in the afternoon after uh, after it's been sitting at room temperature at school all day. There you go. Fred's a little mushy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I want to see, uh, let's see those gloves. Oh, oh yeah. Can someone model them? Can one of you put them on and, and start hitting the other one? We're not going to do that on TV anyway. <laughs> so I don't know if you guys know, but oh, if you guys know, but um, the gear works for people that are really famous, to be honest, in the MMA world. Uh, they train uh, Justin Gaethje, I would say the majority of you probably know who that is. Um, Daguerre, do you want to talk about Rose and um, Usman and the variety of other people? Shout out to uh, Trevor Whitman. Uh, that's the one that designed these gloves. Shout out to some guy named Peter Longpipes as well. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I didn't put two and two together until after until today because I I saw the 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 gloves didn't have the Peter long pipes on them in that, uh, Instagram thing. Right. It, it was no. the computer. So you had, yeah. So I saw the computer and I didn't realize that that was going to go on the gloves. Yeah. No, we had, uh, talked a while back about your daughter getting some, and then I looked into it and it's basically like, we don't, we don't make stuff for children, but figured I could get you a pair so you could at least like train with your daughter. That would be amazing. And I want, I, I'm psyched to blow her mind. The best, the best in the world that are fighting with this right now. And you got it with your name on it. <laughs> That's badass. 
So I'll be like, uh, what movie was it? What was it like a Will Ferrell movie where he's like in like karate class with a bunch of seven year olds and kicking their asses? Like what movie is that? Uh, Anyone have any idea what I'm talking about? I do. But that's going to be me versus Gemma. I'll be like, all right, let's spar. And then she actually beats you up. Yeah. <laughs> Just be careful. She's going to get big on you, Peter. And you're I know. She, she has a sick kick right now, and I'm psyched to see her get better and better. Um, yeah. She'll be, she, she will not be one to fuck with. There you go. There That's you what you want as a father. I'm, I'm setting her up for her teenage years. Yep. <laughs> and now you can do it together. So, well, it's uh, almost noon. Wow, I get, we can get out early today. That's fantastic. I get some shit done. <laughs> um, it looks like it looks like I guess we're going to do a clubhouse this afternoon, Peter. If you want to, um, Craig is going to be late, and Leaf can't make it. If uh, if we do it, we'd have to. Could Craig do later? Basically. Gemma for the next couple of weeks has like a four to six activity on Thursdays. Okay. And so it, if we did it, I'd have to just start the room at like three 30 and, and leave it to you. Or we could do it at six 30 when we get back, which is what nine 30 for. Yeah, that's going to be late for them for sure. Cause he, they well, get well, one of them can't make it right. So yeah, one of them can't make it. Um, so maybe we just think about a different day. Yeah, or or this is only for another couple weeks. But yeah, we we can we will figure it out. Okay, all right. Let's let's blow it off for today. I'll take a break. I I get plenty of shit to catch up on, so that's good. Yeah. And uh, we'll pull it back together once you get back and, and, and you know, off the new schedule. Sounds good. Awesome. I wanted to give a shout out to our uh, guest next week. It is Ian. Uh, we talked about him with Layton's uh, dear friends from Modern Epigenetics. Oh, Mountain. Mountain Organics. His yep. name is Ian. Um, I'm really proud to have him on the show because uh, there's another guy that I feel like the community really respects. He's somebody that's out there that's going out of his way to educate. Um, and I don't really anybody hear anybody talking shit on his name or anything. So I'm excited to have somebody of his caliber be on the show. Uh, so if you have questions next week, you know, get them into me on the DM. Uh, you'll obviously see that I'll ask him on air. And Chad Westport just reminded me that we're continuing the IPM conversation with Matthew Gates, uh, among others, on Saturday. Shout that out to Matthew the, Gates, Sync there. Angel. We can talk bricks and theories about it from uh, John Kempf and others. But anyway, all right. Well, everyone have a good Thursday or uh, Friday if you're in Australia or... I yeah, was Lally on the show today? I didn't see him. The Australians uh, were underrepresented him. today. California was well represented. There you go. You want to do your roll call? All right, where are you all from? Where we ended? <laughs> do you even bricks though? That should be on a t-shirt. <laughs> Even you need to get on that, buddy. All right, here we go. I got a P2, so I have, I have a shelf life right now. Yes, please smash that like button. Uh, that's something that we can really uh, appreciate if you guys go out of your way just to, if you enjoy the, the stuff that we're doing, just please let others know about it. Uh, this, is, this channel is really starting to, uh, Thursdays is really starting to grow. We appreciate that. Uh, we just want to continue that progress. Definitely high in the Rockies. That's us right now. <laughs> you haven't been hitting as hard as you usually do shout out to sano gardens for this stuff yeah that stuff is um nice and white quality <laughs> quality i got my boys here Layton. the boys are upstairs i thankfully i don't think you can hear them running up probably punching each other <laughs> beating the hell out of each other we got the headphones on so i think that keeps it down <laughs> well did you see my dog just jumping up in my lap? I kept having yeah. a puke because he was barking like crazy. ATL. Yeah, when your dog I mean, first yeah. was coming on, you you could only see like the top of the head, and it looked like a skunk, like you were petting a skunk. <laughs> Actually, can, can you give us speaking of what that reminds me? Can you give us a little hair toss? Me? Yeah. 
Oh yeah, I left it down today, didn't I? You got some locks. It's pretty fucking long. That is it. That is a head of hair that would make Chad Westport envious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I just lost. Uh, I was like you. I washed. I washed it um, because I, I had to go to the job this morning really early, and I got fucking covered with shit. And I came back, took a shower, and didn't have time to friggin' tie it up. Well, it was still wet. We like yes. when you boys shower. I, I took I took the rare uh, morning shower today. <laughs> well, I was fucking with high elemental sulfur, so you get all sticky and nasty. So I was like, "Fuck it, I got I got to get in the shower." Plus, I needed a shave. I was looking like an old man, like you with with a fucking gray beard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my beard's not black anymore. No, no, you got to get some of that. Just for uh, men. What's what's that shit you put on <laughs> it? Just for men. With yeah, uh, what is it like, Keith Hernandez and uh, who who are the two Mets that were the uh, the spokesman for Keith Hernandez and baseball. does anyone remember that commercial? Am I dating myself? Uh, you are definitely dating. No, that that's not that old. That was eighties, I think. No, yeah. no, no, what? No, no, but they they weren't the spokespeople in the eighties. They're like current day spokespeople as older dudes. Uh, no. I don't all right. Know. I was hoping someone in the chat would say who the uh, other guy was, but <laughs> Layton's becoming You're one beetle. of the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, we we should. Uh... Oh, so other things is um, Clubhouse. Mister Toad pointed out to me is uh, is now open to Android users. So oh, I'd love really? to see a bunch of Android users jump on and we can start having some fun conversations that include everyone instead, nice. of, one, like, instead of one tenth of everyone or whatever the awesome. uh, yeah. I'll iPhone get, I'll, market share is. I'll hop on a lane for, well, I'll, we'll wait two weeks, right? Because you want to, you got two weeks more, two, two more Thursdays, Peter, and then you'll be back. Yeah, we could do it on another day too. So whatever. But yeah, thir Thursdays, yeah, probably two more weeks. Yes, because Thursdays, like, I'm just doing this on Thursdays. Like, every other day, I'm working like a friggin' maniac, except for Sunday nights. Well, Sunday well, hold on, but Elaine's West Coast, right? So yeah. we could go later. We don't have to do four. No, we don't have, we definitely don't have to do four, but I'd like, you know, I'd like to have Craig and. and oh, right, right, right. Okay. Well, yeah. unless, you know, unless you want to do it a different night, I could just, you know, grab her for something special, like we did with Wolf on that th uh, Sunday night. Yeah, we'll, we'll 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 text about it. And see what makes the most sense. We'll figure it out. We can see. Uh, to me, with Elaine, I, I'm always interested to see where all her disciples agree with her, and where each one's kind of broken from the the doctrine of Elaine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I view it as all these like Protestant reformations. Like she's the Catholic Church, and then people are like, I agree with 95 percent of what your teachings are, but here's the five percent where I break off, and here's why. Um, and then kind of the evolution of her thinking and, you know, that, that gets to what we were talking about earlier. Like, are you willing to update your thinking and be challenged on your way of thinking? So it's interesting to see people who have evolved their thinking with new information. Uh, that's, that's going to be a touchy one, but I'm willing to go down that rabbit hole. But there, there are some things that she, she's, uh, like acknowledge that she she's changed her kind of mindset on right no, no she's definitely yeah, after meeting chris of, trump she spoke on that yeah she's definitely come out of her box you know I, I poked her head out i should say but uh, yeah when i first introduced chris trump to her they were not happy <laughs> or when, <laughs> well, i should say when i called her out on it because chris trump actually lane went out there and taught him how to use the microscope when he was on his journey and that was before he got went down the um, complete, uh, you know, natural farming rabbit hole. So when he was speaking at one of our conferences, and she was too, I put them in a car together and I said, "You guys need to talk about this shit because, you know, it's working. This is two thousand year old science." And Elaine, you can't deny it. You, you can't. You can't shit on this stuff. So they chopped it up for a little while. You know, got a little dicey, but you know, she came around to understanding that. It, the dilution rates are insane, you know, one to 500, one to a thousand, you know, how, how is a little bit of alcohol going to hurt plants at that kind of dilution? Or how, how is a little salt water going to hurt a plant at that dilution? It's not, 
it's just providing a, a, another catalyst. So it was it was an interesting conversation. I'll, I, I assure you that. But you know, she did eventually calm down and, and start to understand that. No, we're not throwing alcohol on plants. No, we're not pouring seawater on plants. It's just a dilution. Um, and and came around to understanding how powerful it actually is as a tool. And then but, I f I feel like when when people kind of describe Elaine, they they almost describe a world where like no academic researchers give any credence to like microbes living in the soil. And and I don't really I. Like, I feel like a James White, like, has a very good, solid understanding of microbes and the fact that they're <laughs> they're pretty important. And and it, what what was so profound about what she said that other soil scientists weren't saying or were denying? All right. or... so, so here here's where here's how it all went down. She went to I pretty sure it was Texas AM. Um, and she, her, her whole focus was on um, aquatic biology, which was when I first, you know, found that out, I, that was our connection. I was like, oh my God, I'm all about aquatic. I, I, I didn't know that that was her initial focus. Yeah, That's yeah. interesting. She was working with oysters um, in Galveston to try to find out, you know, what was killing them, what, what was the pathogen that was killing them. And so anyway, she met Russ, who was a nematologist, um, and they became an item. And so Russ is all about killing nematodes. And she was like, Russ, did you ever think like maybe there's some beneficial nematodes out there? And maybe you shouldn't be using, you know, these chemical compounds to kill the root feeders. Uh, maybe there's a different approach. And so and, she, and is this in the 70s, the 80s? Yeah, this, yeah, this is back there, man. 70s. I'm pretty okay. sure. Maybe even, you know, or, or late 60s. But anyway, so she got him thinking about, you know, nematology as a whole, because all they ever did was focus on killing them and, and finding the, the root feeders. And so <clears throat> that kind of drove her to lean towards soil biology instead of aquatic biology. So there was this like, I don't know colliding of worlds where all of a sudden nematology see now you have to understand too that russ's was russ's whole you know um department is financed by big ag trying to kill fucking nematodes so he had to tap dance through all this shit to actually start looking at beneficial nematodes so combined they brought out it's like nida funding all the cannabis research yeah, right. right? <laughs> like well, we so need you to prove that it's bad and we should regulate it or forbid it. Right. And so either way, you had these two worlds collide that opened up. A Sorry. And just quickly, world. someone asked Russ, who I uh, just give context. Russ. Russ is Elaine's husband. He's a great guy. I've met him. Elaine basically said, hey, will you babysit Russ for me <laughs> when I was at Rodale? So he and I went to the bar and, and sat down and had, you know, a couple of beers and and just chopped it up on nematodes hard. And um, it was one of the greatest times I had. And I think, we, yeah, and I did it one other time with uh, my buddy Richard, who's a, a worm herder. Um, and we, again, we sat down with him. And, and by the end of the conversation, he's like, Leighton, you know what? You probably know more about nematodes than anyone I've ever taught um, just by default because you're so curious. And so that was that was a great compliment. And, you know, I, I appreciated the time having such a superstar, just one on one or two on one to, to chop up, you know, some of these like understanding that nematodes will actually snap their tail around the leg of a bug and fly up into a tree. So the nematodes are smart enough to use other insects as vectors or vehicles to get them to spread and travel and crazy shit like that. So anyway, back to Elaine. So Elaine based on, you know, being married to Russ in many ways, opened the world's eyes to the fact that there's this incredibly biologically diverse engine that fuels the insects, the birds, the, you know, the macro um, organisms. Prior to that, people like just figured, oh, well, bugs are the lowest order. or Maybe there is some biology, but not on a level that the biology is now understood at. It's okay, so so the James Whites of the world did not really exist in the late seventies. Like people yeah, were no, like, of course, no, like microbes no. are critical to you know gut health and soil health. No, this is okay. this has all been exploding hardcore since probably 
maybe maybe in, as early as the 90s, but my gut feeling is it's more toward 2000 when this really started to come out and, uh, you know, it became a, a serious conversation. And not just a... So people know who we're talking about. Yeah, not just, not just a couple of people or a couple of scientists or a couple of scholars chopping it up. It really became, you know, publicly aware when she did the... Uh, announced the first soil food web or introduced, I should say, the soil food web as a entity to the world. Um, and and she, she went through a lot of shit. I mean, some of the stuff they did to her. And again, it's, you know, it's the chemical companies that don't want people to know that there's biology in the soil, don't want you to know that you can actually grow 100% organic and regenerative without any chemicals. Yeah, it, um, my buddy Efren studied under Chappie, who introduced mycorrhizae to the world in the 70s. So, he, you know, again, it was like that window, late 60s, early 70s was when pretty much people started talking about organisms in the soil. And, you know, back to Elaine, like they, they this one woman tried to take her fucking down. And basically she was a student of Elaine's and someone got to her. And so she basically took fresh cow manure and compost, made a compost tea with manure and molasses and grew out a coli and then sent it to the EPA. And then the EPA said, oh, no, no, you can't be using compost tea. You can't be using compost tea. And that woman all of a sudden retired. How does that fucking happen, right? That was a fucking total setup that, that almost took Elaine down. And she fought her way back through it was, and was like, explain to people, no, I never told her to grow with fresh manure. What kind of idiot would do that? And then add molasses? That's just insanity. You're going to make a putrid, you know, friggin' disease-causing friggin' nightmare. And so that was, you know, that that's what she was fighting against when she was really trying to push the world to understand that, no, there's a whole nother living organism in the soil. It is alive. It's the living skin of the earth that drives all life on the earth. And now, you know, here we are, how many years later, 40, 50 years later, and people are finally aware of, you know, just how important that living skin is. Without that living skin, without that healthy soil, there would be no organisms. There'd be nothing living. Uh, well, didn't uh, Dr. Lang Ingham, I believe she was doing work at the University of Georgia, and she was doing uh, work at the CSU in Colorado, and I know that's where she, Monsanto right? started to really go after her name and, and um, use people to bully her yep. out of uh, kind of speaking on that. Um, Leighton, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I believe Harvard started using some of her concepts as well um, and kind of promoting that, and then people started coming after Harvard for using compost teas and that kind of stuff. And then I also believe that um, the Bellagio Hotel was using some of her concepts for a while um, in that fancy ass room that everybody sees that they change uh, with, the, with the seasons and that kind of stuff. Never seen that at the Bellagio. Those are all real plants in there, real yeah. roses, that kind of stuff. And uh, from my knowledge, they don't do that anymore. So what went down? Um, a couple things. First, Harvard, yes. Uh, Harvard was using um, compost teas uh, with my buddy um, James Satillo before he passed away um, and I was working with James at the same time to help he was there to stabilize some of the trees okay because they have these ancient trees on their campus that like basically you know they're they're all in the photography I mean it was like the I don't know like a you know heirloom you know giant oak trees and they were all dying because of the synthetics being used so the way Harvard works is they each pot, they call them pods. So each pod is in charge of it, either of this building or this landscape or whatever. So one of the pods went outside the box and said, no, we're going to we're going to look at more healthy, natural ways to save these trees. And so they got involved with Satillo. Satillo got involved with me down at Rodale. So I started making him product for uh, the, the Harvard campus, as well as the uh, Rose Kennedy Greenway which is where they did the big dig and they put the parks on top of it. Um, so yeah, they, they went down that path cause they had no choice. They were losing the fucking trees. And so eventually they took over uh, how to make this and how to do it on site instead of having Satillo come up um, and prepare and, and apply it. So that was one success. And yes, the Bellagio uh, definitely went down that path. And the problem with them was that, 
basically when you walked in there, you know, they'd have these guys in these fucking suits with respirators and they're spraying this fucking fungicides and insecticides all over the place because, you know, basically the insects would move in and take over the place in, in the lobby. And you can't have that shit. So, you know, they were like, well, we're scaring the guests away with these dudes in the suits spraying this crazy fucking shit because they never close the place. It's open 24 seven. So how the fuck do you spray toxic fucking chemicals when you're, you're spraying right in front of your, your, your clients. Right. So that wasn't cool. So they got, they got Elaine to come out there and, and start teaching them how to do these organic practices. Um, and they went down the road and they, and they started seeing, you know, really good plant health and, uh, good living soils. And then they too started to take over the process away from a contractor that was doing the work. And they tried brewing their own teas, except for they brewed it outside in the blazing sun uh, and basically started, you know, spreading pathogens on the plants. So they went mm -hmm. back to fucking synthetics again. And I don't know how, I don't know how they're treating it. Maybe they came up with, um, you know, like more user friendly, like where the guys don't have to wear these, you know, Tyvek suits with respirators and fucking full masks and shit. So it doesn't look as bad as it was. Um, but yeah, that was, those, those are some real stories, dude, for sure. They went down. Yeah. And I wish that would have continued. Cause, um, I, I really, if you guys, again, if you've never seen that Bellagio, I mean, the way that you could maintain that if they were using compost teas in a living soil system, that would be the true treasure for a lot of people to be introduced to that. Well, again, it, 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 it gets to the point where people think, oh, well, I can do this, right? And instead of doing the work, taking the time to really understand what the fuck you're doing, using a microscope to verify you have good organisms so you can do it on a commercial scale, that's the problem. It was, it was just like Mariah said. You know, she's like, you need to call a consultant. At certain times, you need to get a consultant involved, someone who's specializing or someone who really understands this much bigger picture than you do, you know, spe do your shit, specialize in, you know, if you're a cannabis grower, be the best grower in the world. But if there's certain times when you do need to bring in somebody outside of your group or, or, you know, your, your, your web to, to help you get over certain humps. And that's, you know, that's the big mistake. Like these, you know, these big cannabis, the guys that the big growers who jumped in for the money, <clears throat> this is where most of them are going to fail because they just look at the bottom line and they don't think about or worry about like, Hey, I really need to bring in someone who knows what the fuck they're doing, pay them handsomely to do it so that I don't have cross lost crops and, and, you know, other issues, uh, de dying plants. But <clears throat> for whatever reason, you know, when money gets involved, it fucks everything up, man. And the yeah, they don't give you an extra 5k a month, but they're losing 25% right. of the How much fucking money. How much fucking money do they make? Are you fucking kidding me? You can't afford to have somebody who knows what the fuck they're doing treat that place with, with a compost extract? There's no excuse. There's just no fucking excuse. It's greed, literally. And fuck the planet, right? And that's exactly what got us to where we are. Because everybody's so focused on the fucking money, they don't fucking give a shit about the planet itself, whether you're extracting oil or fracking. Fucking whoever came up with fracking ought to be skinned alive, man. Motherfuckers destroying the water table. The water is so fragile right now. I mean, that is going to be the biggest limiting factor in the future. And and yeah, you can desalinate ocean water, sure. But you got to remineralize it. Otherwise, it fucks up the human body. And then where are you getting the minerals from, right? All we have to do is put organic soil down, stop drilling wells, stop spreading fucking poisons, and the fucking soil will filter the water out. I mean, I talk about this over and over again, the movie Symphony of the Soil. Down at Rodale, they did an experiment. Four bottles. One was a pure organic system on, on, the on the right, and the one on the left was a pure synthetic system. The guy poured 100 mils of water in it. Water went through the, uh, the synthetic system, came out all mucky. It, you know, that, the water was dirty. Pretty much the whole 100 mils that he dumped in went right through it. And on the organic side, when he dumped 100 million mils in, most of it soaked up, and the water that dripped out of the bottom was crystal fucking clear. And that's what healthy soil will do is, is clean that water and make it purified so that you can drink it and mineralize. But no, let's just fucking frack it, screw up the aquifers and, and groundwater systems, you know, because we need some more money. 
Have you seen that documentary where it shows people that, you know, they do live out in the rural areas, but they'll turn on their kitchen sink and they can light their water on fire? Yeah, yeah that's from fracking, dude. That's from fracking. And I, yeah, fra- what always surprised me about stuff like that is like, I can't imagine any community, like I'm thinking Pennsylvania, which had a lot of fracking, right? And it's like, what community would be like, you're going to do what? Like, yeah, come on in. But then even if, even if that community has no choice, like the governor of a state, like who, who would, it, it's stuff that you would never think would get greenlit that gets greenlit. And you're like, who, like, Pen, like if you're the governor of Pennsylvania, you take pride in your state and part of that pride no, my you assumption it is like it's pride, of, pride that it's a healthy, like uh, it, happy environment that your state is all about. And Peter, it's like, you, oh yeah, come on in and, <laughs> and missing, pump it full of the one point. Politicians are there because they're greedy. They don't have a conscience. They're fucking narcissists. They don't give a shit about you or their state or anybody else. They're just there for power and money, purely, purely. And you know how frackers are getting away with poisoning the water, like to the point where you can light it on fire at the kitchen sink? It's called proprietary knowledge. We yeah, that, that's the crazy them. part that they get to shield yeah. what the ingredient the, list the is. Fucking shit they're putting down on the ground. I mean, it, and again, it's it's all about lobbying. It's all about you know paying a lobbying firm ten million dollars, get us a permit to frack in this state, that state, every state. Pay pay everybody off as much as you need. Just do it. And that's basically what happened. And these people, just like the chemical companies, just like the motherfuckers that make that forever chemical that's on Teflon, that's all in every food product that you buy, that coating on the inside of that chip bag, that shit is fucking really nasty. And it's in our food. How the fuck are these guys getting away with this shit? You know, talking about the BPA stuff. Uh, no, it's it's the it's the stuff that's in Teflon. And in, it prevents grease from soaking through your bag. So your, your potato chip, it's that silver lining on the inside of it. I forget the exact compound, but they call it the forever compound. Peter, Google forever compound. That'll, that'll tell you exactly what the fuck it is. And, you know, it's just, it, I, dude, I get so fucking pissed off about this shit because it's all about money and power. And nobody gives a fuck about the planet. And we're going to just wipe ourselves right the fuck off. Seriously, man. Because who's going to stop this money that, that's now in charge of everything? You know, it's a fucking issue. And, and no, we're going to have green jobs. Yeah, just another fucking greenwash. You know, it'll be another big money grab for the big corporations. And it won't do anything for, for restoring the soil back to fucking a living soil system. No ground left bare. There it is. And that's just in our drinking water. <laughs> that's just in the fucking drinking water. Think about all the food you eat. Think about the, the eggs you cook on your Teflon plant pan. Think about, you know, anytime you eat a bag of potato chips or any kind of like donuts, anything that has any grease, they use that to coat the inside of the fucking packaging. Leighton, do you think if you're, you know, your family is buying um, bottled water, like from a company like El Dorado, that you wouldn't have those contaminants? All right. The only way to get rid of those contaminants is RO. There's no other way. And even when you do RO, we don't know exactly what the efficacy is, like how much is actually still getting through. You're dealing with tiny, tiny particulates. So if, especially if you do not maintain your RO, which a lot of people don't, what they don't realize is that all right, you're squeezing water through a rubber glove, right? So that's pretty impressive. But eventually those holes get bigger and bigger um, as you put so much pressure on. And if you're not changing that RO filter periodically, then you're basically not cleaning your water to the what you think you are. So, you know, that, that all has an issue. And then even if you do go through RO, reverse osmosis for anybody that doesn't know what that means, um, you've got to remineralize it. Because if you drink RO water, you're going to steal calcium, you're going to steal magnesium, you're going to steal potassium out of your body because it's going to naturally attach to that water molecule. So you're, you're detriment, you're, you know, you're knocking your health back, your ability to, you know, like we said, remain healthy so that you can fight disease. Um, so we're, yeah, we're just fucking, we're on a bullet train to hell, people. On a bullet fucking train to hell. And I mean, anyway, well, that's the uplifting ending we needed to this conversation. <laughs> oh, really? 
as Slow blue and green tank just walked in that's the that's the one and only thing he heard in this conversation smoke more weed man it's the only way uh, well, education we're putting it out there more and more people are finding out about all right, it mr toad asked about uv all right uv is a great for killing biology that's all uv does so years back i designed a um, a water system to pull groundwater or rainwater. So I had a cistern, I'd catch the rain. Um, if, if we didn't get enough rain, I would actually pull groundwater out of the ground, and polluted ground uh, on this on this rock. It was a fucking tip of a point out in the ocean in Maine. And I built a house on the rock. But there was not enough area for septic system. So I had to put a composting toilet system in. The guy did not want the fucking water uh, from the state or the town because they're at the end of the line and all the chlorine builds up to the point where you literally turn on that tap water and you're like, oh, my God, you can't even fucking breathe. Right. So he wanted fresh water. So what I did was I um, I ran it through micron filters first, then RO. Uh, then we uh, mineralized it, uh, ran it through activated carbon to take any tastes out um, and then put it in a storage tank. And then when it came out of the storage tank, we hit it with UV just to make sure that nothing could start growing in that storage tank that could be passed on. And the system worked great. The water tastes great. You know, it was it was a pleasure to drink it. Um, but that think of the fucking energy that went into that to, to scrub groundwater to make it, you know, safe for human consumption without any concerns whatsoever. The electrical bill was insane on. It. I mean, it worked, but that you can't cost effectively do that. You know, unless we have free energy, unless we get Elon to fucking start blasting fucking energy up into the ionosphere and then have free electricity and internet for everybody. I don't see the world going there. Do you? I don't, well, we Maybe. could, I could put on my tinfoil hat. We could talk about the reason why they want a, a worldwide net network. <laughs> yeah. The tinfoil will help protect you. Hopefully. Well, I mean, with a <laughs> worldwide network, you can, you can keep track of everything, right? Well, they already, that's why they're injecting us with this shit, man. Talk yeah. about nano shit. They, they get us with their phones. If we take our phones or stop using our phones, how are they going to find us, right? How are they going to know what the fuck we're doing, where we are? I don't know. Sorry, guys. Didn't mean to go down that fucking <laughs> rabbit hole. But <laughs> fucking shit pisses me off. After Layton's closing, go find something after we end that brings happiness to you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> lift, lift your collective moods back up. Yes. Hey, go outside in the sunshine. I yeah, feel like for me, for me that involves going down. outside right now. I don't have sun here, Peter. And we all cloudy. Yeah, no, it's oh, a little cloudy here. One it's one definitely day? cloudy here too, but oh, I, I just I just got a big uh thirty gallon tank that I'm gonna fill with wood chips and water and make it anaerobic and then uh Actually, that's something I want to talk about on a future thing once I do it. But ba basically, make it. I, I watched this Paul Stamets video, and uh, you're gonna make it nice. yeah, and then I'm gonna take it out. And I, so, what's the idea here? It, it's that the it's anaerobic, and all the anaerobic microbes come to life. Then you suddenly take it out and lay it out in the oxygen, and those all get killed, and then all the the mycelium basically yes. eats the dying anaerobe, anaerobic yep. microbes as as their food? Yeah, this is what well, I've been talking about for a while. The only way to take dirt to soil really quickly is to use an, uh, a low oxygen tolerant or low oxygen um, compost brew or extract. So in parts per million, it'd be more than zero. Zero <laughs> is anaerobic. You're going anaerobic. But I usually go, you know, four or five parts per million. Aerobic is eight parts per million. But when you apply that low oxygen, you're getting all what's called oxygen tolerant or what's better known as um, facultative uh, anaerobes. So they can live in the anaerobic environment <clears throat> and in low oxygen environments. And you use those as the food source for the aerobes. So that's basically what you're doing. You're doing kind of what's called a solid state fermentation or an anaerobic digestion. And then, you, like you said, you take that out, spread it out on the outside. <clears throat> and that becomes, it's just like a Petri dish for them. It's just loaded with food. Well, so, so, so then is having an anaerobic condition in your compost bin, like I, I have two 55-gallon drum uh, compost tumblers. 
And sometimes I don't mind them getting anaerobic for a little while. I mean, I bring them back, but it, what I'm hearing is, is it, is it not necessarily bad to have anaerobic conditions in a compost pile? And, and then, all right, you want to get yelled at by Elaine? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be my leading question. <laughs> All right. So, so this is this is a topic or a subject that she has she has come around on. Um, she will not encourage it because she's afraid people will be morons and do stupid shit and hurt themselves, and then she'll be liable for it. But bottom line, Peter, is when I first started doing my work, um, I was taking fish manure that stunk to high hell. I mean. You got that shit on your clothes or on you, and you'd smell for days. And so you had to be, you know, careful with it. Um, and I would aerobically stabilize it. And there were some that I could not. Like, even after two weeks of fucking pounding it with oxygen, I could not fucking stabilize it. So then I started learning to work with the, the aquaculture farmers to better get their system to an aerobic state. And by doing that, their fish health improved. Their die-off numbers were, were back. Their, the growth of the fish was was better. So, again, it's like, yes, you can take the nasty-ass shit in the world and aerobically stabilize it and turn it into something healthy. Um, think about the hog farm or not the hog farmers, the milk farmers up in Vermont. Um, every year, they spread their lagoons. So all winter long, they're storing that nasty-ass shit. They don't bubble it. They just pour it in the fucking in a big pit. And then they come and suck it out and spray it on the field. And dude, when they spray that, I mean, oh, you can barely breathe the amount of ammonia coming off. But then the crop comes in, the corn grows like fucking crazy, and everybody's happy. So it's the same thing. You're 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 following these aerobic and anaerobic uh, processes to better fertilize or gain traction to grow something out. So does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it, it, I, I'd love to, we need to sit down and I'll take samples of like my stuff at different stages. And, you know, cause, so, and sometimes with the tumblers, I let them go a lot more anaerobic. And then other times I, I don't let them go at all. And it'd be interesting just to look and see. And then also like a couple months later after it's come out, like, like my tomatoes, like that was my example. That's exactly what I put on them and uh they're loving life right now so like to, yeah, to then take a sample of that stuff that's in my two by four bed for the past four months and kind of see that's that's where the microscope comes in you know if you if you have 300 bucks i'll be more than happy to train you how to use it and then you just get the camera holder and you can just shoot me pictures of it and i can say oh this is what this is or this is what that is or that's an anaerobic or that's a facultative anaerobic or you know, I can give you the, the information um, so you can better see how that transition happens. But in the end, you definitely want, you don't want to be putting an anaerobic extract on an aerobic soil because you're going backwards. You're killing the anaerobes, the aerobes. So, but you can use the anaerobes to transition from dirt into um, a healthy living soil system. That, that works, but the opposite does not set you back. So that's why the, the power of the microscope is so important because you can identify you can identify it with your nose, but I've I've smelled stuff that doesn't smell and seen that it was loaded with ciliates. So you can shoot yourself in the foot um, with the old nose nose. So that's one of those things you have to be careful about. It's a tool that yes, it'll give you a direction, but it's not something you can guarantee is going to work. So if it has no smell, I'm I, I'm leery of it. If it smells like shit, I know it's shit. If it smells good, I know it's good. So you know, just if people listen to me, just make sure if, if it doesn't smell, don't think that it's automatically good. It could still be bad, and it could it could fuck your soil up. Because remember, those those ciliates, they will eat your flagellates and they will eat your your aerobic organisms, um, and it'll set your whole soil system back. So it's like you know cleaning cleaning your slate. You don't want to do that. It took you. But long they look cool. <laughs> they look. They're, they're the fun. They're some of the funnest to watch under the microscope. Oh yeah, the ciliates just zoom around. <laughs> Roll the or the like, stock cili ciliates, which are like. Yep. Yeah, the street sweepers, the stocks, the, the stock ciliates street and the rotifers are both have a double flagellum uh, wheel that spins the food down their throat. I mean, they're amazing nutrient cyclers. They're fucking badass as hell. What I what they do to water 
they clean the water, they clean the, the suspended solids out of the water. Um, I know a place in Connecticut that's actually growing rotifers in a tank and running the lake water through that tank to get the rotifers to strip out the turbidity. So when they're pouring the water out, it's clear. So they're used, this, this place is using nature to help clean up. up like up. as filters. Yeah, as a filter, yeah. which is what they do. And, you know, I don't mean to get all negative again, but when, when I first <laughs> <Damn>. started. <laughs> we had everyone back in a good place mentally. Well, or I, I won't go there. Bring, bring it on, bring it on. No, I won't go there. But, I have a question for you, Leighton, if you want to keep it positive. Yeah. Uh, facultative anaerobes do you feel like that it might be the secret um to some of these farmer success is yeah, that when things absolutely. are swinging yeah. it's how to transition soil from dirt to soil you know it's they're they're the key to the whole thing um you know like I, i've said the story a million times of what i did to harvey's farm it was it was one application of these facultatives one application of foods and then one application of aerobics on a 10 acre field and that fucking field popped. Um, so it's, it is definitely the key to, to transitioning out of what I want to call dirt into a, a healthy living soil system. And then once that system is healthy and is starting to uh, come alive and thrive, is that, you know, do you add that maybe once a season, once a year? What? Well, once, once you've made the transition, you never go back. You don't, okay. you don't really need the facultators. They're going to be there anyway whether they're cysted, again, as long as you don't use any synthetics, that's the key. You use synthetics and you've got to start over again. What did you say? Once you go facultative, you never go back? <laughs> <laughs> well, Is that, I, I'm thinking of the line from Airplane. Think about this. this. One of the most, most epic lines in any movie. Well, uh, think about this, right? You have a heavy rain event, your soil's anaerobic. It's going to be anaerobic for a few days until it dries out again. So nature goes through these processes um, all the time. And so you have to think about swamps. Think about, you know, where where you have uh, water collecting naturally, like uh, vernal pools. Um, at some point, they're going to be anaerobic, but then they come back as aerobic. So it's part of the process. So once you get the living soil system set up, which means some of these facultative anaerobes and perhaps even some anaerobes, um, then you transition into an aerobic environment. What happens to the anaerobes is they cyst up, they go to sleep. And not to say that you don't lose some diversity, you probably do, um, but that diversity will come back the next time um, it goes anaerobic because these organisms are floating around in the air, they're in the water, they're in the rain, they're everywhere. So the problem is, again, is when you use a synthetic, you fucking clean the slate, except for, except for bacteria. That's the only thing that's going to survive that. And, and if your soil's compacted, guess what? You're gonna have anaerobic bacteria. If your soil's fluffy, like that's why they plow it, you're gonna have aerobic uh, bacteria, but that's all you're gonna have. And, and without a protozoa or a predator to eat that bacteria, you're not releasing any nitrogen. So remember, the, the, the predators eat the carbon source and shit out the nitrogen. That's why they call it nutrient cycling. So there's all the free nitrogen you possibly need in a healthy living soil system, but it's not available because it's in a living bacteria. It's not being eaten and pooped out. So that's why these organisms are so important. The fungi are 50% of your whole soil system. They build the aggregates, they produce nitrogen or uh, nutrients for, for the orthropods in the, in the case of saprobes, they produce nitrogen or nutrients for the plants as far as the mycorrhizae is concerned. So, you know, the whole system as a whole works fantastic. Like, look back, you know, a thousand years, this place was the Garden of Eden, so we got out of control. Um, so I mean, The ammonia form of nitrogen when it's done that way, is that correct? All right, so in composting, you're going to get ammonia. You can smell it. Like, that's when you stick your hand in that hot compost that you get down at your uh, local, you know, um, what do you call them, uh, supply house. You'll see the compost that's steaming, it comes off. If you stick your hand or nose in there, you're going to smell ammonia. Problem is you're losing it. It's gassing off in a, in a gaseous form. And you want to store it in a solid form so that your plants can uptake it or, or so the microbes can break it down and release it to the plant. So that's, you know, that's the other side of, of composting that's a huge problem is that we take this green waste and this food waste, we churn it, burn it, and ship it out the door. And basically, we're gassing off all this ammonia. 
And so you're losing the fertility. Um, you're not letting it cure, which is a, another problem. I mean, I kind of like what the, these guys out here are doing, all right? They're taking in yard waste and food waste from all over the place. Uh, you know, L.A., you know, all this Santa Barbara, all these cities. And they're grinding it up. They're comp super fast composting it. It's not even finished. It's, it's really not compost. It's, it's organic matter that's on fire, literally. And they spread that shit on the fields, and it kills all the wheat. Great idea, right? And then you till it in, and as you till it in, now it becomes – aerobic uh, you you've maintained or you've kept some of the ammonia but most importantly is you've added carbon to the soil and you've taken a waste product and returned it back to the earth so as far as i'm concerned that's okay and what would elaine say about that Tillian? well you know that's <laughs> we got to start doing something right we can't just keep dumping all this shit in landfills so we ha whether it's right or wrong that's irrelevant we we have to be dealing with and so I think personally, any organic matter, any carbon we can sink into the soils out here in SoCal is, is important. Don't call me Shirley. We, 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 still the air, the air, we, we went off on an airplane tangent. Uh, but I, that made me laugh. Yeah, All right. Well, that pee uh, I had to take like 45 minutes ago, I, I still have to. Good what time is it? Oh, well, man, we, we're still going. I forgot. I thought we cut off. Uh, oh well. <laughs> Cut off. All right. Should we should we call it there now that we we've uh we didn't end on an on a pessimistic yeah. commentary of humanity and our future. Yeah. Don't worry, people, be happy, smoke more weed. We ended thinking about airplane. Yep. And uh all right. Well thank you everyone. Have a good Thursday and uh Saturday uh late and your hair will be outdone by mr chad westport uh we'll be covering a lot of the same topics as today but hopefully some new and different ones on the ipm front so, there you go see you everyone all right peace out everybody see you guys next week